Young back. Or up. Touchdown, Wolverine. Looking over the middle, caught, touchdown Wolverine! McCarthy extends the play, now he leaves his legs, McCarthy up first down. <laughs> Washington, USC, UCLA, and Oregon are joining the Big Ten. These are four virtually unknown, unheard of football teams that we are going to introduce to you for the first time. Right? Okay. Also, <laughs> Michigan has a new defensive line coach and Ohio State has a new running backs coach. Viewer comments, viewer community poll, all coming tonight. We are back, back from vacation, ready to talk some football. Welcome Boom. to the Big Ten Team Rivalry Show. We're not insiders. We're not professionals. Uh, we are just uh, father and son who love to talk about football. We want you to talk about football with us. Join the conversation. Have some fun. And uh, talk about those rivalries, talk about those traditions, and, uh, you know, maybe razz each other a little bit. That's kind of what we do around here. Uh, if you're out there and want to hop in the chat, go ahead and do so. Uh, we will get to those chats as soon as I figure out how to turn that on. There we go. It is now on. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> Thank you. Only been I, long now. What? I said we've only been doing this for how long now? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I am your host, Clifford. I am a professional web developer, amateur woodworker. With me, as always, is Mac. Mac, how's it going over there? I'm bored, man. We didn't talk football last week, and that made me sad. But now we're here, and we're talking football. And, you know, here's the thing. Don't drink and drive, kids. That's that's all I got. That's That's fair. That's good. Yeah. That's, you know, just life advice from Team Rivalry. Don't drink yeah. and drive. Don't that's do fair. it. That is smart. Not too long ago, we were shooting for 500 subs, which a year ago at this time, we were at 61 subs, 61, just a tiny we little baby channel, really tiny. And we were looking for 500 subs and we got there. Once we got to 500, we said, you know what? It'd be really cool if we could get to 600. We got there. We said, you know, what? it'd be really great. 750. If we could get to 750, that would be awesome. And we got there. And it's we really cool there. because we are now sitting at 759. We actually dropped down to 758 for a few minutes and then back up to 759. So I don't know who that guy was, but he left. It's but probably somebody, an Ohio State fan. Somebody came back. So now we are on the road to 1,000, just like our favorite team, the Michigan Wolverines. And we're going to get there. And we're hoping to get there before the season starts which gives us like three months, which hopefully we can do. Hopefully we uh, do something here that everybody loves to, to watch. We can uh, have some entertaining football talk and uh, everybody will join us in that. Subscribe, like, comment. It's free. It's a good deal. So as always, that's what I like to say. Yes. If anybody's out there, it looks like we're running a little lean tonight on uh, viewers. <laughs> Shut up. You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. People are still on vacation. It's still it's still Easter. Probably. Yes. Uh, anybody out there in the chat, go ahead and throw your uh, throw your favorite team's battle cry on the chat. Let us know uh, what school you're rooting for. Yeah. Seems in the like meantime, uh, did you tell me how you're doing? What, what What's happening over there? How's your week been? Oh, it was good. It was good. Yeah, Easter was good. It was a good week. You know, work was busy and all that. It was fun. Uh, Michigan got a new defensive line coach, which I know we're going to talk about. I'm pretty excited about it because he's from my alma mater. So that's dope. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's about it. Yeah. Right. Talking realized. football. Yeah. We got some big changes here. Uh, we've switched sides on the screen. I don't know how I managed that, but there it is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Come back from vacation and everything's, everything's different. Everything's topsy turvy. <laughs> All right, we're going we're gonna to go over to the uh, community poll. We had a good one. Uh, again, anybody out there watching, if you want to drop in the chat, tell us hello and put in your favorite team's battle cry. That's what we got. Mm -hmm. And I have a big surprise. I don't know if you saw this yet, Mac, but here it comes. You ready? I, right. Yes. Sorry, I am. Yeah. <clears throat> oh! Look at that. 
Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I was messing around with the AI and finally came to that, and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What are those letters? That looks like a backwards N, a yeah, I know. backwards B. That's I don't understand why the AI doesn't understand the alphabet. How? What? What is the deal exactly? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. It's really bad at writing things. I know. Like writing text. Yeah, just like I found like it, it can't do code very well. I can't handle code very well. And, and now it can't yeah. do... Well, it's not been able to do letters very well. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't they know They think AI is going to take over the world. It can't even spell. I know. But I mean, that looks better than the old button. <laughs> That's fair. It's better than what I had before. Okay, the community poll. Let's get into some talk. We were fooling around too much. <laughs> We uh we had a video up. Well, actually, okay. For anybody who was at the uh, watching the live stream two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the quarterback situation at the various or at the top five Big Ten schools, top five rankings via Athlon Sports. And of course, Penn State was one of the teams we talked about. So Mac put up this poll: Will James Franklin ever win another Big Ten championship? Tell us why in the comments and check out our video. The video is still on the site if you want to watch it or go back to the live stream. Yes. Yes. As I pulled this up, we have 72 votes. And uh, I just realized I didn't click on the one that showed the... Man, every week there's... <laughs> How did I not <laughs> see that? I was wondering if you had it on like the next slide or something. Like That, that doesn't nope, show the results, I'm though. I don't... <laughs> just a buffoon. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, somebody so, commented on it. I'm sure we can get to it. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got the comments. I don't know why. I, you know, I look at it and I'm thinking, okay, that looks good. And then I realize I forgot to grab the one that actually shows the results. If I if I get you a screenshot, can you put it up? <laughs> uh, here, let me let me do this real quick. Well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the comment in a second here, but I can tell you right now, we've got seven percent of the we've got 83 votes currently. 7% say yes, 93% are saying no. Man. So <laughs> so 93% of the people out there, or at least 93% of the 83 voters we had said that uh, James Franklin will never win a Big Ten championship. So here's some of the comments we had on this. I This, this is the one <laughs> That's good. that I thought was great. Is, is he getting the OSU job after Ryan Day runs out of excuses? Then I'd say no. He's a good coach, not great, not elite. Penn State has been behind for a long time. They were number three at best till this coming season. With the new teams in conference expanding, I'd say third to sixth at best indefinitely <laughs> till Penn State gets an elite coach and makes some good investments in the program and more alumni step up uh, to help with the NIL. That's from Ben Bread 79 I, I think it's a great comment. I think that's what we've been yeah, saying. Yeah. I, what, what's your point? What's your take on that? This is, he makes a good point with that last sentence there that alumni need to step up and help with NIL. Have you heard anything about Penn State's NIL collective? Like anything? No, not really. I know literally, I understand we're Michigan fans and couldn't be bothered to care about Penn State, but you know, we're, we're sports fans too. And we like to hear about things that happen across the state of, you know, college football and Michigan gets a ton of crap for their NIL, not being the best, you know, the, the best situation, but I haven't heard anything about Penn state having an NIL collective at all. They have one. Yeah, I haven't either. And Trace, Trace McSorley, Christian Hat Hackenberg and LeVar Arrington are among the former Nittany Lions participating in an NIL event at the 2024 spring game. Happy Valley United is Penn State's NIL collective. I was today okay. years old when I found out that this exists. <laughs> I don't know. Are, are that many teams behind in NIL? I know Michigan was behind. Ohio State seemed to be on top of it. I don't know. I would know. have expected Penn State to be on top of it. I don't know that I would expect Penn State to be on top of anything, to be totally honest. I mean, because like no. I said, James Franklin, but that's why James Franklin is like the perfect Penn State head coach. Not elite, but good. You know, good, yeah. good, solid. I mean, Penn State, not an elite school, but a good school. Good, you know, and no disrespect to anybody who's gone to Penn State. Like you, all college degrees are the same unless you want to be a lawyer or a politician. And then, I don't know, Harvard, I guess. But yeah, Ivy League. Or, or uh, if you want to get you know business, then you go to Stanford or Michigan, I, I think. 
but whatever. Anyway, but like, I, yeah, it, that's, that's, that's why he's the perfect Penn State coach. He's not elite. You know, he's just good. He's a good coach. You can you can reliably count on him for eight to ten wins a season. And, right. you know, speaking as a Western Michigan alumni, I don't see anything wrong with that. It seems to be, and I guess it, you'd have to coach for a long time to figure out where uh, James Franklin s- stacks up against Joe Paterno. I, Joe Paterno yeah. coached at Penn State for what, like, was it 40 years? 45 years. Um, Wait, seriously? Joe Paterno yeah. coached Penn State for 45 years? It says here 1966 to 2011. Um, okay. Was he Dang. the head coach that whole time? Yes, he was the head coach the whole time. 409 victories and 136 mm-hmm. losses. So Joe Paterno is, aside from, uh, and I hate to brush it aside, but aside from what happened uh, that that forced his retirement, um, he is one of the elite coaches of the past. Yeah. So James Franklin at this point has to be. A step down, you think? Yeah, a but step back again, I mean, well, it, yeah, he's not as good a coach as as um, Joe Paterno. Wow, I immediately forgot his name. <laughs> uh, he's not as good a coach as Joe Paterno for sure. But actually, I'd be curious to know how many Big Ten championships Joe Paterno won in those forty five years. I mean, obviously, it's forty five years, yeah. but. James Franklin has a Big Ten championship. Maybe if he sticks around for 45 years, he'll have right. just as many Big Ten championships. Well, let's see here. Uh, Turner won the Big Ten championship three times. Well, okay. Uh, that's Big uh, Ten, though, man. because they were only in the Big Ten for the last 20 years that he coached. Oh, that's um, true, too. Yeah. It says he has had 29 finishes in the top 10 nationally uh what they, were they independent before the big 10 no they were in no. big east weren't they or acc oh my goodness where did it go championships uh well i don't know how much Oops. it's gonna matter somebody's gotta look that up yeah whatever we can get to whatever that. yeah i <laughs> uh, the next comment we had was from Ken. We saw Penn State has all the ingredients to be a championship team, but something is missing. Hmm. Coaching. Coaching. Yeah. Do you, does Penn State have the same issue right now that that the Detroit Lions have had? No. Well, that's ownership. Is Never it mind. a? Yeah. That's not a fair comparison. Well, but I mean, maybe the question of culture is is worth digging into, but I don't actually even think that's the case either. Everybody seems to be really excited to play at Penn state. All their players really seem to buy into that team every single year. Yeah. I mean, James Franklin, it sounds like James Franklin is a really great coach to play for. It's just, I, when he, it's like I said, last, um, last time we were on James Franklin doesn't coach adapting to the ebbs and flows of the game. He's not a, proactive coach he's a very reactive coach yeah. so i guess maybe he does react to the ebbs and flows of a game but he reacts to them with extremes i mean going for it and for on fourth down the couple of times he did against michigan not good calls that was fairly extreme he shouldn't have done that mm-hmm. um the two-point conversion not a good call fairly extreme shouldn't have done that he's not a proactive coach he's not a planner it seems like so whenever something happens in a game he always seems to overreact to it is he overreacting to it or is he just, is he a hardliner on the analytics? Yeah, well, well, but I mean, what in, in, okay. So I guess that, that goes to adaptability then. So yeah, he, yep. then he, then he can't adapt because the analytics are robotic. They don't understand the feeling of the game. They don't understand momentum. And, and and the analytics don't understand that they're going up against a defense that had national championship ambitions mm-hmm. and an offense that, that just couldn't be stopped on the ground. Right. So, yeah, analytics yeah. are, I mean, they're stats. They're, it, it, it's the same situation that you always have with stats. They, they, they can paint a picture, 
and they paint a picture for a given moment, but they don't necessarily paint a picture that's uh, accurate in all situations. Right. Yeah. Which is why they're stats. Stats are always an average, which is what you're talking about. It's it's adaptability. You have to be able to look at the stats and say, well, this is what normally would happen, but stats don't take into account the the drive of the other team. Yeah, like exactly. You just said, if the other team is is barreling down the road for a, a national championship, the stats aren't taking that into account necessarily. So you have like you said, you have to be able to adapt your analytics to the moment what's that um wasn't it in that that leadership book that Bo Beckler wrote with uh was it john Bacon who helped him yeah. write that yeah was it john bacon uh, or mitch album oh where is it? i think Over it was there somewhere. i think it was bacon i think yeah i think you're right I think, yeah um wasn't it him who said that like he would come up with the game plan before every single game and so uh well obviously that's what you would do but you mm-hmm. would basically and plan each facet of the game out and say things like, okay, if we're in this situation in this with this amount of time left on the clock, then we do this or we take this stance. If we're in this right. situation, then we take this stance. So you, you kind of adopt your, it's almost like um, the art of war by Sun Tzu. You kind of, isn't it Sun Tzu? Whatever. Yeah. You take, you, you develop a, almost a philosophy of gameplay but your philosophy has to be flexible depending on the conditions. Okay, so if, if right. you're if you're attacking your enemy and the enemy makes a move and maybe you didn't explicitly plan for that because you can't. You can't explicitly plan for every, every move that your opponent could possibly make. But what you do is you kind of take the overall feeling of the, the situation, take everything that you can into account and make an educated move based on all of that. And James Franklin, he doesn't take anything into account other than the game plan that he's put together. I, I feel like his game plans are almost too specific in that kind of a way. So he really lacks flexibility. At the beginning of every game, he says to himself, all right, fourth down, two, uh, two yards to go to a first down maybe. Um, if we're on Michigan's side of the field, then we're just going to go for it. And he sticks to that no matter what. And then, and then puts his quarterback in a position where if the court and, and Drew Allar all game long was not hitting some of the more important throws that he needed to hit. So, but at the beginning of the game, he probably told himself, James Franklin did, if we're in that kind of a situation, this is the play we're going to run. And he stuck with it despite everything about that situation screaming at him. No, don't make Drew Allar throw the ball on fourth down. It's not going to go well for you. And he did it anyway. Yeah. But a good, I, I think a good coach in that situation would take that into consideration and be like, all right, well, if we are going to go for it, we're going to run. But actually, probably you shouldn't go for it at all. You just, you got to be more flexible and he's not a flexible coach. So will James Franklin ever win another Big Ten championship? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, all right. All right, you ready to look at some viewer comments? Yeah, let's do it. We had uh, some interesting ones this time around. Um, the uh, <laughs> the clip on the Ohio State Buckeyes quarterback room did not make a lot of Ohio State fans happy. That's all I'm going to say there. Yep. No, not at all. Which was interesting because we were saying they had – a great quarterback room. We were just wondering, you know, how many of them were going to stick around given how many they had because NIL and transfer portal, somebody's going to leave, but apparently you're not supposed to say that. No, you can't say that. The viewer comments this week. Otherwise, here we go. By the way, you noticed the graphic. Ooh, yeah. Oh, I like it. I, <laughs> I like this like 40s, 50s noir thing that you're, you're doing. That's here. exactly is what sweet. it is. I use that in the prompt with the AI. <laughs> That's awesome. I like it. Yeah. yeah all right. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Comment number one comes from Cisco 302. And this is from the, uh, even the NFL knows Michigan did not cheat video, which was uh, actually the week before last, but since we didn't do a live stream last weekend, when you look mm-hmm. at the way that this entire nonsense was staged at ESPN. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me, uh, 
I, I should uh, introduce this first, though. Uh, we're talking about uh, the NFL vindicating Michigan. And what we meant by that in the video was because the NFL was sending so many scouts to watch the Michigan draft hopefuls. Um, and it was like more than it, there was a record set for how many uh, NFL scouts were watching the Michigan draft hopefuls. And what that shows to us is that the guys at the NFL, the, the NFL recruiters know that the Michigan players are for real, that they weren't um, artificially supported by cheating. So mm-hmm. what Cisco here says is, and this was a, a fascinating take on it that I don't think I had considered. You can remind me if we did or not. But anyway, he says, when you look at the way that this entire nonsense was staged at ESPN, there is no doubt this was cooked up to get Harbaugh to go back to the NFL. ESPN repeatedly said that this will be Harbaugh's last year at Michigan, that he is going to the NFL next year. They said this over and over and over. There was big money driving this agenda. Don't waste any more time talking about this. Sorry, we're talking about it just a little bit more. (laughs) <laughs> the entire thing was a show. It was intentionally staged. How can people not see this? ESPN's coverage proves it. Mac, your thoughts. I think he's 90% right. Yeah. So Connor Stallion still did something. And that's why he's an American hero. Right. But he still did something. And that something got him, you know, fired or got him to forcefully resign. What he didn't do was set up the massive spy network that he was accused of setting up with Jim Harbaugh in control of it and the Michigan, you know, football program funding this, you know, massive network of college football spies, which is something out of a really bad Bond movie. (laughs) But uh, I think I think I think this is how I feel, too. I mean, there's no actual evidence to suggest that this is the case, but. Come on. <laughs> I mean, sometimes there are conspiracy theories that just make so much sense. How could that not be the case? So like, yeah, you look you look at it being staged at ESPN. It really feels like it was. It feels like I, I don't think anybody really liked Jim Harbaugh at ESPN or the NCAA. The NCAA, we've talked about this before. Jim Harbaugh was trying to take money away from the NCAA and the Big Ten and give it to the players. Okay, so that was part of his whole thing. Also, he was pro-life and ESPN is, you know, however you want to feel about that. ESPN doesn't like that too much. So they had some issues. I just feel like no one really liked Jim Harbaugh in the media, except for Fox. Fox liked him because he was pulling in numbers, man, like for sure. So I think, yeah, I, I think that this this was probably staged. It feels a lot like it was staged. Um, I think that it's unfortunate that it did end up being Harbaugh's last year because now it kind of gives a little bit of teeth to whether or not um, something happened. But I, the only reason I think he went back to the NFL was because um, he won the national championship. I mean, he set out Mm -hmm. to, or he accomplished what he set out to accomplish. That's why he's in the NFL. Uh, Blow me up today. Sounds like a new guy. Hey, blow me up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for commenting. Uh, what he didn't do was network better since everyone shares signs. So Connor Stallions that didn't too. network better? I guess. Or yeah. Harbaugh didn't, or I don't know. I Yeah, everybody's sharing signs. There's like teams are yeah. coll- uh, colluding with each other to share signs about common opponents. So whatever happened to that too? Like Purdue and Ohio State were caught sharing signs. Um with each other about Michigan and they still couldn't beat him. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I mean, honestly, he's probably right. We shouldn't waste any more time talking about it until there's like new information coming out. But I guess the whole thing is just mind bogglingly stupid. And there are still people out there that think the only reason Michigan won the national championship was because they cheated. Like just stop. Right. Yeah. That's clearly not the case. Yeah. Comment number two. You're in on this one. <laughs> and I love this. Yes, Your sitch was a clown. Okay, so this comes back to our, uh, we're going to go back to Penn State here for a second, our Penn State uh, quarterback room video. Your sitch was a clown. Now that they have a real offensive coordinator, Andy 
Kotelniki? Kotel- Kotel- yeah, probably Kotelniki. Could be the missing link <laughs> to open up that offense. They've got the talent. And part of what drew me to this is uh, our friend Connor Stallions, Ohio- uh, owns Ohio State, commented, you're insulting clowns. <laughs> <laughs> Your such offense oh was so basic that even Stevie Wonder could call out the plays. Andy Kotelnik, real offensive coordinator equals only time will tell. And then you replied, I do have to wonder, though, would any OC be that much better than James Franklin as head coach? So was your such a clown? I remember when your such got fired, which we all said yeah. was like, OK, that's not the problem. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think Penn State's offense was really that bad. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, they, they didn't beat Ohio State and, and Michigan State or Michigan. So, wow. They didn't beat Ohio State or Michigan because of the offense ish, but Michigan had a defense for days. I mean, they had a generational defense. Ohio yeah, right, State's yeah. defense got incredibly better year over year. So, I wouldn't judge an offensive coordinator's performance based on two games against arguably the two best defenses in the country. One of which is probably the best defense in college football out of the last five ish years. Yeah. And also he had a first year starting quarterback. I just, I don't think firing Mike Yersich was, was actually going to solve anything. I, I think because what they did was they got the same amount or they, they, ended with the same performance that they always do under James Franklin, except for the big 10 uh, championship year. I think it's James Franklin, but yeah. sure. All right, bring in a new OC and let's find out if it's not the OC. I mean, come on guys. Like we yeah. can only, we can only, uh, I don't know, ignore this for so long, I guess. Right. Well, and I guess this is the kind of thing that gives me sort of that shades of Detroit lions. You know, it's mm-hmm. like they keep firing this coach or that coach. And the same thing that what remains static year after year is the ownership and they don't seem to understand the real problem. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, yeah. Final viewer comment. This comes from our Wolverines quarterback video. It's definitely an underrated QB room. I think the worst case scenario is they go with Jack Tuttle, and that's not a bad thing. As a backup, the last two years, he has completed 82% of his passes out of 39 attempts. That's not bad. Mm-mm. For two touchdowns and no interceptions, that's fantastic. He also rushed uh, for 35 yards uh, this past season as JJ's backup. And Joseph Joseph Allen says Tuttle is our best choice right now. I don't know what everyone is smoking. <laughs> and I'm trying to decide: is it I? Okay, in my amateur opinion, I think the job is up for grabs between Tuttle and Orgy. And I think you picked. Did you pick Orgy first, or did you pick Tuttle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I picked uh, Alex Orgy to start. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I think this is a situation where it's it's honestly, it's pretty basic. To me, Jack Tuttle is a solid quarterback um, that you you pretty much know what you're going to get. I, I hesitate to say the word game manager, the phrase game manager, but that's kind of the vibe I get, but he can, he's, he can run. And so he is a dual threat quarterback. So yeah, he'd be a good option for sure. I just feel like his ceiling is not as high as Alex orgies. Now orgy is kind of the X factor that we don't really know a lot about um, the unproven commodity, I guess, but just based on his athleticism alone, I think we can kind of extrapolate what we've seen so far and, and um, reasonably say that his, uh, ceiling as a quarterback is higher than than Jack Tuttle's. So to me, it's if Alex Orgy is ready, then he's the clear starter. If he's not, then yeah, put Jack Tuttle in. He's he's a consistent quarterback. He obviously knows what he's doing. He has the experience. The one thing that I think we need to consider though is where Davis Warren is at, um, and then Jaden Denegal. Because mm-hmm. Jaden Davis is a true freshman. Freshman, He's not going to be ready. Well, I guess he could be, but I think Alex Orgy and Jaden uh, Denegal and Jack Tuttle will have him beat out. I don't know where Davis Warren should be in this pecking order. But to me, I, I think it's it's Alex Orgy as the starter, and then Denegal and Tuttle would be backups. And I don't know who would take which spot. I've heard really good things about Jaden Denegal, though. Is he, the, uh, is he a five-star or is he a four-star? 
Uh, I think everybody's a four star. Everybody's a four star. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard uh, a couple of, rec- or, well, at least one recruiter talk about uh, Jade. Yeah. Jaden Denegal being uh, a hot, hot talent, like JJ McCarthy level, but. Okay. Or at least can be if he's developed properly. Yeah. Okay. Well, and that's, right. that's the key, but you think the Kirk Campbell is the, the, was the quarterback's coach last year. I believe he's the OC now. So you've got consistency there. So mm-hmm. it's, it's entirely possible that the ceiling can be realized with Kirk Campbell and, and the, the consistency in quarter, uh, the consistency in offensive coaching. Mm-hmm. So it's entirely possible that they get there. Right. All mm-hmm. right. You ready to go to our first story? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Now we're going to get in some actual news. We get done with the polls and the viewer comments and all that. <laughs> our first story. Our first story comes from the Wolverine Wire, our friend Isaiah, Th- uh, Isaiah Thomas. No, he doesn't what? play for the Pistons. His name is Isaiah Hole. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> Uh, Lou Esposito is the new defensive line coach at Michigan. Uh, Michigan football hires new defensive line coach to replace Greg Scruggs, who unfortunately uh, was, you know what? Did he, was he fired or was, did he quit? I think he I actually think he, resigned. He was forced re- to resign. Yeah. Forced to resign. Okay. So he had yeah. to step away. Um, some DUI charges going on there. We hope he gets that worked out. Lou Esposito is the new guy. So here are some of the details on Lou Esposito. Well, first of all, Isaiah Hole writes that Memphis defense was less than stellar a year ago, which is where Esposito comes from, although that's not actually relevant. Uh, Esposito has a positive track record when it comes to developing talent. Familiar with the state of Michigan, he's coached not only at Western, but also at Ferris State, where he was a defensive coordinator in 2013, and he was the head coach of Davenport in Caledonia, Michigan, which is here <laughs> yeah just up the road from me yeah i uh, from 2014 to 2016 his key career stats okay so when he was at western from 2010 to 2012 that was pre pj fleck head coach was uh, bill cubit they had an overall record of 17 and 20 for those three years bill cubit i uh, was there from 2005 what yeah, I think so. I couldn't figure okay. out when his first stop at, at Western Michigan was. I kept looking for it. Was he there when Fleck was there or something? Like, that's amazing. No. Holy crap. No, he oh, was yeah, there okay. with Cubit. So that, yeah, Cubit, that's yeah. kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Cubit was fired after 2012 because the 2012 season was uh, dismal. One in 11? Yeah, something like that, yeah. I, mean, I got to look that up because it was not good. Uh, yeah. So, well, okay. So, and this is where, as we were talking before the show, this is where I'm concerned about Lou Esposito because this is what I'm seeing he comes from. In 2013, Ferris State, uh, in 2013, he was the uh, defensive coordinator at Ferris State. Uh, The notable stat there is that uh, Zach Sealer um, had 13 sacks, and that was a single season record at Ferris State. From 2014 to 2016, he goes over to Davenport, where they have an overall record. He's the head coach. He was the head coach at Davenport. Oh, I think that overall record is wrong. I think that was for the last season. Oh, oh, that's right, because only no, he was, <laughs> only the 26 only. stats are available. So I don't know how he did in 14 and 15, but in 2016, their overall record was 6 and 5. With and these are not too shabby. Uh, an average um, points per game of twenty four point six. Average points allowed per game seventeen and a half. Not not bad. Worse. Yeah. I uh, mm. so then from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty three, he's back to Western Michigan, and this is oh, when did Fleck leave Western? Uh, after the two thousand sixteen seventeen season. Okay, so he came yeah. back. So he was there with Fleck for his last year. 2013? No, from 17 to 23. No, he he started with Tim Lester in 2017. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So he comes back to Western. He's the uh, defensive coordinator and defensive line coach. Um, Those years were not good for Western, have not been good for Western. The the peak was in 2018 when they went 7 and 6. Last year they were 4 and 8. So this is Lou Esposito. Yeah. 
<laughs> my my opinion here is is that I'm not sure if this was the only guy available. <laughs> and Sharon Moore said, hey, he's a Michigan guy, state-wise. And uh, said, yeah, we'll take him. Or does Sharon Moore see something in Lou Esposito that is not obvious from these stats? Yeah, so Lou Esposito, he's got a lot of ties. I mean, obviously he's got a lot of ties to Michigan, but he's also made a lot of relationships with recruits in Michigan, which is, and I guess Illinois. So that's the biggest, I, I think one of the bigger things about it. The other thing is that He's apparently known as quite the developer. Um, so one of the issues at Western Michigan while he was there was not the defensive line. It was the defensive secondary. Michigan, Western Michigan's defensive line was actually pretty decent. Um, they were in every game that they played. I mean, I don't think that they actually ever really got blown out in any particular game, but they, um, or at least not that I can remember, I kind of didn't pay too much attention because they weren't doing very well, obviously. So there you go. Um, and Michigan was busy winning Big Ten championship after Big Ten championship. <laughs> right. Um, but their defensive line was was still pretty good. It was just their secondary that had issues and then an offense that would score if they felt like it. I mean, sometimes they would score a lot. Sometimes they wouldn't score at all. So West, they just really couldn't go anywhere. So what I'm seeing on Luis Pasito, though, is that he is he is known as a developer. And I think that that's huge. I think that that's really good, considering that if they couldn't have Greg Scruggs, who is a proven commodity at Wisconsin, at least they got somebody who they know is good at developing talent. And Michigan already has arguably once again, one of the best defensive lines in college football again this year. They're they're deep at that position. They've got a couple of really good returning starters in in Grant and I forget the other guy's name. I just know him as a really good starter. But they've got talent there. They've got so much talent for him to work with. So this is a really good hire in that kind of a way. Even if it is his first stop at a at a call it a really you know a big boy job if you will, at a what a, like a power five job I guess. Although the power five doesn't exist anymore. So yeah. I think it's a good yeah. hire. I think that the only thing is that he's not really proven at the highest level, but he's obviously got experience in a lot of different uh, a lot of different arenas, specifically on defense with a couple of head coaching positions or just the one head coaching position. Yeah, yeah just, just the, the one. one. At Davenport. Um, I will say, though, Ferris State has been winning. Is it Division three? I think that they're in Ferris State is a really know. good football team. I feel like he was also at, um, oh, he wasn't at, okay. So I thought he was also at GVSU, but he was in, okay. So the great Lake football conference, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but in any case, I think it's a good hire. I think he's got enough experience and is proven to a point. I think that the only thing questionable about him is can he replicate the success he's had at a bigger, uh, at a bigger school, bigger program with higher ambitions. Yeah, what I I mean speaking of Fair State, whether they're division three or not, what I found interesting is is Davenport is not even part of the NCAA. No. So there's this NAIA, the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, which apparently doesn't separate by divisions. They're one single division. So uh to Lou Esposito's credit, Davenport joined the NCAA in twenty seventeen. So he apparently developed them well enough that they could become part of an NCAA division. And I think their division, oh, they moved up to division two, I believe, in the NCAA. And that's different from FCS. Yeah, FCS is division one, yeah. but yeah. it's... No, it's, yes, no, you're yeah. right. F it's FBS division one, FCS division one, and then right. division two, division three. Yeah, and FCS, I think that it's like division one A and division one B. Okay. That Somehow, makes sense. something like that. I it's it's a strange division, but I so so there is that. What I found interesting too is that they're they're talking about at least in part they talked about him being from Memphis. Yeah. So he got hired at Memphis um, after the twenty three season or early in twenty four. Uh, after the twenty three season, he yeah he he quit Western to go to Memphis. 
He was there for two and a half months. Um, and then Sharon Moore hired him at Michigan. So he, he never really coached at Memphis. He just got the job for a couple of months. Yeah. I, yeah. So <laughs> can you really say he's from Memphis? Then? Yeah, that's that's what I found strange. I don't know why Isaiah yeah. Hole brought that up, but I don't uh, know. Other... Maybe that. Well, I was just gonna say maybe that's something that because they they saw something in him too. Because Memphis isn't exactly like a pushover either. They have pretty decent seasons every once in a while too. Mm-hmm. So maybe they saw something in him. I don't know. I guess to me, yeah. it, it almost feels like they they would have been the the proof that you needed to know whether or not Esposito was gonna was going to live up to expectations, and you would have liked to see that pan out. But I think what what Michigan did here was maybe I think they bought a really promising stock at a really good price, <laughs> and obviously. <laughs> Obviously, that it could still not work out. It, it could still not work out with anybody. I mean, we even don't really know how the Sharon Moore era is going to finish, but are going to work out. But I do think that it's it's that kind of situation where he's he might not be proven, but the ceiling is high. Yeah. Same thing with the quarterbacks. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. So but this also means that the coaching staff is set now at Michigan, right? Yes. They've, yep, they've got everybody. All, all the positions are filled. Mm-hmm. Moving forward, the spring game is set in two weeks? Yeah, I think Yeah, it I is. think the spring game is in two weeks, and we'll see what Lou Esposito can do in two weeks, I guess, <laughs> or, or two and a half weeks. Oh, and here, okay, so here's another thing. So Esposito, while he was at Western Michigan, was known as one of the, uh, the MAC Conference's top – uh, assistants, top okay. position coaches and all that. So he's, he was actually highly sought after. Um, and he had also developed a couple of Western Michigan's, a uh, few NFL, um, L- NFL caliber defensive linemen. So he has actually put a uh, defensive lineman in the NFL and he did it at Western Michigan. Okay. So that's obviously lends to the developer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. I don't know. I, I read those stats and his experience and all that, and I think, man, this is not – there's nothing here that stands out as, wow, this guy was a good hire. Um, but, well, yeah, I think maybe, that maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I, he's He took, <laughs> he took <laughs> defensive linemen from Western Michigan who wasn't exactly pulling in the best of recruiting classes under Tim Lester. I mean, I think the first right. one he had was actually – yeah, actually, Tim Lester's first – recruiting class at Western Michigan was the highest rated Mac recruiting class ever. And he barely made a bowl game that year. And actually, actually he, they were eligible, but they didn't get selected because they only had five FBS wins. Um, But then the next year they just, they kept getting, well, I think actually one year they made, they won eight games or something like that, but they could just never get over that hump. And then this last year they didn't go anywhere. I think they went five and eight. Um, or five and seven. Um, but they still put a couple of linemen in the NFL while uh, Esposito was there. So, I mean, I understand it's Western Michigan, but that that's what makes it a big deal to me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll see. I suppose we will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next story comes from Buckeye's Wire. I guess all of the schools have their own wire. That's kind of nice. From Buckeye's Wire, we have Carlos Lachlan is named Ohio State running back, running, running back, running backs coach. And that's Carlos Lachlan. Lachlan. He's uh, he's from the Ducks, from Oregon. So we've got some trading going on here between the new Big Ten and the old Big Ten. Carlos Lachlan. Now, got to be honest here this I, I i looked at this story and i looked at his stats and i thought oh man this is a good hire <laughs> so now if you can work this around the other way and find out why he's not that great of a hire i don't know i i think he's going to be really impressive at ohio state so here's what we've got uh from buckeyes wire uh mark russell over at buckeyes wire 
Lachlan has spent the last couple of years in Oregon in the same position where he has excelled. In 2022, the Ducks ranked sixth in the country in rushing yards per carry at 5.52, and then did even better in 2023, moving the rushing attack all the way up to number three nationally with a 5.91 average. Lachlan seemed to have, oh, this was the, uh, yeah, this was the interesting part. Lachlan seemed happy in Eugene recently signing a contract extension to stay with Oregon earlier in the offseason. However, the pull of Ohio State seemed to be too much. He has signed a two-year contract to come to Columbus, and OSU will pay a $366,667 buyout to Oregon to complete the transaction. And the reason this is interesting is because, again, this is another one of those situations where Carlos Lachlan was, I think he talked about Oregon uh, being his dream job. And then he goes over to Ohio State. You can't trust anyone when they say that their dream job is whatever school because right. it's just. <laughs> and I realize mm-hmm. he's not the head coach. We'll get into that. Actually, actually, there's another one like that. Uh, UCLA. Well, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, <laughs> Key career stats for Carlos Lachlan, first coaching job running backs coach at Western Kentucky in 2021, helped produce one of the nation's top offenses in Western Kentucky in 21, hired as running backs coach at Oregon by Dan Lanning in 22, helped Oregon have two 770 plus, 7, 775 plus yard rushers in 22, that being Irving and Whittington. In 23, Oregon's only losses were to Washington twice, <laughs> both times by a field goal. Wow. <laughs> this, seems like, this seems like a really good hire. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was funny that, yeah, the only team they lost to was Washington, and they played Washington twice, once in the regular season, once at the uh, <laughs> uh, Pac-12 championship game. Lost both times by a field goal. Uh, nevertheless, that was a, a good loss because Washington goes on to go to the national championship. So this is why I'm looking at this one, and it's a complete reversal from Lou Esposito. This looks like a good hire. It is a good hire. It's it's a great hire. It's yeah, they they made a great hire. And I'm going to say this. um, I've said this a million times and I'll I'll say it again. I do not care what Ohio State's offensive weapons are as long as their O-line still sucks. (laughs) All right. (laughs) They had all the weapons last year. They had all the weapons in 2022. They had all the weapons in 2021. What they didn't have was an O-line that could compete with Michigan or Oregon in 2022. So, but again, it okay, so let's pretend for a second that Ohio State has an offensive line that is going to be better this year because I expect it to be better. I do. I think, I think Ohio State has... It is going to improve in a lot of ways. I, we don't have any specific evidence to suggest that the offensive line is going to get better because I don't I don't think I've seen anything as far as like transfer portal pickups or anything like that for the for the offensive line. Actually, that's not true. They they got the center from Alabama, the guy who fumbled every <laughs> snap. Which is not, I you know, I feel bad for that kid. I don't mean to laugh at him. I just think yeah. it, it was kind of an interesting pull because the reason he didn't do so well was because he was going up against a Michigan defensive line that actually could be even better this year. So not really sure what they were thinking there, but whatever. Okay, the kid can get better. That's fine. I don't see improvement necessarily anywhere else. I just kind of expect it. It's Ohio State. They're developers of good talent. They should be able to put a a good offensive line on the field. So let's pretend for a second that they accomplish this. Their offensive weaponry is scary good. They have some great running backs. They still have Travion Henderson, don't they? He didn't didn't transfer out. I'll look it up. I got to remember. See if you can pull up their full depth chart because I can't remember all their names off the top of my head. But they do have, they still have um, Judkins. Judkins is still there, although there was a rumor he was looking at asking Ole Miss if he could come back after Tony Alford went to Michigan. Um, They still, I believe they still have Travion Henderson. And I want to say Mayan Williams is still there. Isn't he? Oh, hold on. My screen just went crazy. Uh oh. But in any case, Travion Henderson is there. Who's the other guy? 
Uh, Judkins, Quinshawn Judkins. Yep, he's still there. Okay, who else is? It, it, Mayan Williams is still there, isn't he? <laughs> uh, Court Williams is there, but not Mayan Williams. Oh, okay. Well, in any case, I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. I mean, they've got they've got Travion Henderson. If if he can stay healthy, he's going to be fantastic. They've got Quinshawn Judkins, who is, I believe, the best running back in the SEC last year. That's amazing if he doesn't transfer out. The one thing that I think, or not the one thing, because I just mentioned the offensive line. The other thing that I think could be an issue is culture at this point, because we keep talking about is Ohio State buying an all-star team to try and, and, and buy a championship? Or are they putting together a team that can build a culture and sustainably win games together as a team? So let's pretend they can do all of that. Yes, this is an amazing hire. I mean, he 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 coached Bucky Irving and Noah Whittingham in 2022 at Oregon. He coached uh, Bucky Irving again and Jordan James in 2023 at Oregon. Uh, they only had the two losses to Washington. For all intents and purposes, if Dan Lanning doesn't go for a whacked out fourth down conversion, just like James Franklin tried to do, or even if he gets it, then then Oregon's probably in the playoffs and wins the Pac-12, but they went for the fourth down, and we all know how that turned out, and Michigan defeats Washington for the national championship. Go Blue. But the point is, that was on Dan Lanning, mm-hmm. not Carlos Lachlan. So if so, the way I see it is this. This is an amazing hire for Ohio State. If they couldn't have Tony Alford, then they got somebody else who is probably just as good, if not better. But I'm going to say just as good because I don't want him to be better. <laughs> um, if Ohio State's offensive line is good, if the culture at Ohio State is good, then the running game is going to be fantastic. We have a lot to see in terms of whether or not they're going to to what what's going to happen with the quarterback situation with Kyle McCord transferring out, and then they bring in Will Howard, and Will Howard is a wild card. I've heard he can scramble. The Buckeye fans on that one video like to uh, scream and cry about how he can actually scramble and and definitely is a runner. Okay, sorry, my bad, guys. But in any case, we don't know how that's going to turn out. So all of these different variables have to turn out. What what is probably guaranteed right now is that Ohio State can has a running game that should be very dangerous. And that's Jotoris, what I got. Joe Torres agrees with you. They had to fill the spot as quickly as they could. Probably a good hire. Don't have to worry that much with the D-line Michigan has. Was that about Michigan or Ohio State? Uh, Ohio State. I think that might have been about Michigan. Oh, well, all right. Yeah, Michigan had to find that coach as fast as they possibly could. But he's right. Well, you know, and, so did Ohio State. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Either way, he's right. <laughs> either way. Yeah. I mean, either, you know, he has the D line to back him up or he has the D line coming down on him. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. Well, the next thing we wanted to get into was going over the other teams, uh, the teams right. that are coming into uh, the Big Ten, Washington, UCLA, USC, and Oregon. We don't have much of an opportunity. I haven't had much of an opportunity to talk about them. So these teams are relatively, I know this sounds weird because they've been around for a long time, but they're relatively new to us because they don't come up in conversation too much, too much with the big 10. Obviously Washington did last year. Um, and Oregon does, if you're talking on a national level, UCLA and USC come up when we talk about Michigan in, in the Rose bowl days of the eighties and nineties, seventies, eighties and nineties. Um, but now they're big 10 teams. And as Big Ten teams, we need to understand who they are and what they bring to the conference and what challenges they bring to the conference uh, for the other teams. So we're going to start off with Washington. The Washington Huskies. They have a very nice stadium. That graphic is awesome. Just just want to say that. Nice job with that. (laughs) Thank you very much. We start off uh, at a glance. Their current coach is Jed Fish. Uh, Washington has an all-time record of 774 to 465 to 50. So they'll never catch up to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> they have good. 17 good, yeah, they have 17 <laughs> conference titles. 
Uh, 2018 was the most recent. Two national titles, the most recent in 1991. Bowl game record is 2020 and one. Not bad. Uh, the last game they played, in case you missed it, <laughs> was January 8th, 2023, when number two Washington went up against number one Michigan, and I believe they lost 13 to 34. Their next game is August 31st against Weber State, which is a team I've never heard of. I have. Gotta, have you? <laughs> yeah. I think right. they're FCS. All right. Yeah. I, but it must be a West Coast team. It's a local team. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is Ohio State fans better give them a ton of crap for scheduling an FCS team. Yeah. Otherwise, they're hypocrites. Right. So Jed Fish, this is his first season at Washington uh, because Kalen DeBoer just took the job from Alabama where uh, um, Nick Saban just retired. Yes, he did. Jed Fish's career has taken him from the Baltimore Ravens in uh, 04 to 07 to the Denver Broncos to Minnesota, where he was the offensive coordinator in 2009 and the quarterback's coach, then back to the NFL and the Seattle Seahawks, uh, down to Miami, over to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, he was actually at Michigan for Jim Harbaugh's first year. He was oh, the quarterback's yeah. coach, the wide receiver coach, and the PGC. Uh, I forgot to look up what that stands for. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, then from Michigan, he jumped out of there real quick, went over to UCLA to be the OC. Uh, and then he was the interim head coach at UCLA for a uh, season. Then went back to the NFL, to the Los Angeles Rams. Not to be confused with the Los Angeles Chargers, but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Are we salty? Was, uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> In 2020, he was at the New England Patriots as the quarterback coach, then down to Arizona or over to Arizona for a couple of seasons. And now he's at Washington, which is interesting to me because his his first year at what would have been a Pac-12 school, he's actually going to take their first year in the Big Ten as a first time head coach at Washington. I don't know. I it just it's just one of those weird things that I find interesting. Um. So key points in his career is the head coach of the Arizona Wildcats is where he just came from. His first year at Arizona was one and eleven. His last year at Arizona was ten and three with a bowl win over Oklahoma at the Alamo Bowl. Uh, where they won 38 to 24. So he hmm. did a fantastic job at Arizona in just three seasons. Yeah, he did. Taking them from one on 11 to 10 and three. Uh, this is what he said. I did not take the decision to come to the university of Washington lightly, but once president Anna Marie, uh, Kaus. Sure. Koss? Koss? Sauce. I apologize there. Uh, Anna. <laughs> Um, She's not and athletic director Troy Danning showed me what is possible in Seattle and what their vision of the future looks like. There was no answer other than yes, said Fish. Okay, he's a liar. <laughs> well, right out of the gate. <laughs> you are a liar. <laughs> he went there for the coffee and he knows it. He wanted to be next to the first Starbucks. Him and Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is in Florida. Never mind. That doesn't work. Never Him mind. and... Howard Schultz, that's the guy. Him and Howard Schultz have been buddy buddy for years, and he just wants some coffee. No, that's not true. But I don't understand why. He th well, yeah, I don't know. This that's that's odd to me that he would say what the future looks like at Washington. To me, this feels like a lateral move, despite the fact that Washington was just in the national championship. Yeah, because if you look at the Big Ten recruiting rankings for 2024, Washington is at 14. <laughs> All right. Oh, 14 in the Big Ten? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and I get it. He's He's been there for, what, two, three months? It, like, I understand, but I just think it's really funny. I don't know. And I felt yeah. like I needed to say something controversial to, to liven things up. I don't know. To kick this up, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. To go, well, man. <laughs> okay, well, here's where we're, we're going to lean back on your expertise. So this is their schedule for 2024. So my question to you, basically, which is going to be the question for all four teams is what are their key games in this schedule and wh what do you expect from them in their first year in the big 10? All right. So let's just go, let's go through this one by one real quick here. 
All right. Weber State, that better be a win. If you lose to Weber State, you have no business coaching in football ever again. <laughs> Eastern Michigan, same story. Washington State. Washington State is an interesting one to me because granted, I don't really know a lot about them, but I know that them and Oregon State both hold all the chips in the Pac-12 uh, negotiations of some kind. Go Blue Mike. Thanks for hanging out. Um, that, so that's an interesting one. I don't, Washington State, I believe that was a good game last year, and I don't think that they lost any of their um, – any. I, I think that they're consistent in terms of their roster and their coaching. So I'm going to call that – a 50 50 for me. So at this point they're two and one they're home against Northwestern and, and what is his name? Braun coach Braun at Northwestern. I what is his first name? David, David Braun, man, last year was crazy for Northwestern. <laughs> that was insane. How did yeah. they do that? So this season, if Washington's down and Washington, I mean, Washington should have a better roster than Northwestern pretty much any given year. But if Northwestern plays with some conviction, who knows? And that's what they did last year. So that could be a toss up. And, and I'm saying that as someone who knows next to nothing about Washington, other than the fact that Matt, uh, Michigan dragged them through the mud in the national title game. Um, I say that very inflam, knowing that it's very inflammatory and I'm okay with that at Rutgers. Greg Schiano is a great coach. Rutgers is not a great program. If you catch Rutgers at the wrong time, they could make it a game. So in my opinion, if you're Jed Fish and this is your first season at Washington and you need to make a statement, you have to win this game. You have to say to the Michigans, the Penn States, the Ohio States, and frankly, the Oregons at this point, that you're not going to be the type to let Rutgers hang around because everybody is blowing out Rutgers. Everybody in the top tier of the Big Ten is blowing out Rutgers. So if you have a competitive game against Rutgers, that doesn't look good for you. You need to blow Rutgers out. Okay, Michigan, you're not going to beat in year one. Michigan's going to beat Washington. I understand the game's in Seattle. Washington lost everybody. So unless Washington's on some sort of trip at this point, they're not going to beat Michigan just simply because of the amount of development that Michigan already has on the roster and the amount of consistency that Michigan has in the coaching staff. I understand that like Michigan got a whole bunch of new coaches, but like most of them were promoted from within and then a bunch of them have Michigan ties. And then there, there's like two that don't have Michigan ties and they're already proven commodities. So Michigan should, I'm not going to, they should handedly win that game hand handedly win that game. Washington at Iowa. You got to beat Iowa. Iowa's defense is going to give you some fits, but Iowa's offense should give you nothing. So you got to beat Iowa. If you don't beat Iowa, we, we would laugh at you almost as much as if, if you had lost to Rutgers. At Indiana, you have to beat Indiana and you have to blow out Indiana. Same kind of story as Rutgers. If you don't blow out Indiana, we will laugh at you. USC, you're going to lose to. And, and I hate to say that because I like Washington more than USC, just given Michigan's history with USC in the Rose Bowl. You know, nuts to you, Pete Carroll. Um, but I think uh, USC, I don't think, I know, USC has a much better roster than Washington. Lincoln Riley is bringing in some good defensive players, and he's got a new DC. USC wins that game. At Penn State is the measuring stick. This, for me, is the measuring stick game. Penn State... I don't know where they're picked at in the Big Ten pecking order at this point, but Penn State, to me, this feels like a game where if Washington wins it, then they've got an early claim to having unseated Penn State as third place in the Big Ten. And I understand it's third place. Who cares about third place? Well, if you're brand new to the Big Ten and you just had crazy roster turnover and coaching turnover, you care about third place in the Big Ten. You've got an opportunity to show Michigan and Ohio State. They don't have just Penn State to worry about anymore, which we're not really worried about Penn State as much as we just don't want to catch them at the wrong time. But now you're saying to Michigan, Ohio State, and Oregon, hey, we're, we're, we're down right now, but we're good enough to be competitive, maybe even beat Penn State. So in the following years, you're going to have to look at Penn State and us. 
you're going to have to be concerned about more than just these teams, which puts the puts the pressure on the top tier teams and eventually could possibly give Washington a springboard to the top of the Big Ten. So you 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 want to beat Penn State. At the very least, you want to have a close game here. Why are you laughing at me? What did I do? I'll say the last thing we want is for James Franklin to feel good about himself. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Anyway, UCLA, UCLA. I don't think that they were very good last year. Um, Chip Kelly is obviously not there anymore. He's at Ohio state. Who knows how that's going to work out? Um, should be fine. You got to beat UCLA from what I understand of UCLA's roster and coaching turnover right now. I think that you have to beat UCLA and then you're not going to beat Oregon. Oregon's just going to be way too strong at this point. The game's on the road at Eugene. You're not going to beat Oregon. So what does that bring us to? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wins. I think are pretty certain. Two, two of the five losses that I I would predict are toss ups, and then I've got three for sure losses with Michigan, USC, and Oregon. So seven and five, you're thinking? I think I think seven and five has to be your floor. Is the floor, and then okay. and then ten and two is their ceiling. Ooh, all right. And and maybe you've already answered this question, but what, what do you expect? Uh, what do, what do you think they bring to the Big Ten now that they're here? Is that is that any? Uh, is that an answerable question? <laughs> I well, it's they're kind of bringing the same thing that that the other teams are bringing too, which is that West Coast offense or West Coast football in general. Honestly, yeah. um, you know, what was it the the term basketball on grass? I think it was, which is not a euphemism. <laughs> well, I think that comes from. Isn't that from Nebraska? Or was that Wisconsin? Is it? I think it started in Nebraska, but uh, somebody else picked it up. Or was that? Oh shoot! Or was that Purdue? I'm not sure now. I don't know. I, but it, I guess it did start with one of those coaches, either at Purdue or Nebraska. Um, okay. The the whole basketball on grass idea. I'm thinking it was Nebraska because I hadn't heard of it uh, until Nebraska came onto the scene. Oh, okay. But but yeah, but but the that whole West Coast offense the whole west coast style of play was what caused michigan and and virtually every big 10 team so much trouble uh back in the 80s back in the 70s and 80s because in the big 10 we had this you know die by the run style of play and and the west coast had this uh more of a pass uh uh pass situation so they were just faster and it seems like that's why the big 10 didn't often uh, didn't win very often against the, uh, the pac 12 teams or pac 10 teams back then. Yeah. Well, the, not the, that it was never, but that was, uh, that was yeah. often the issue. They, they throw the ball or they spread the ball around the field a lot, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Washington did that a lot last year too. Um, they, they threw the ball quite a bit. I think they ran the ball quite a bit too, but they had a lot of success throwing the ball. And Michael Penix was just amazing um, with what he was able to do. But Michigan ended up adapting uh, their defense to kind of like this bend, don't break type thing. So what's going to be interesting, I guess, is, is if Washington is a part of this West Coast style offense that is really um, spreads the ball around the field quite a bit. Okay, so they the, they have the big play type type plays that they like to do. They like to throw the ball down the field. They're an all or nothing kind of an offense. Not quite like that. I mean, they're more effective than that. The West Coast style offense is more effective than that. Um, but East East side of their Midwest defenses have learned to adapt um, over the years to offenses that like to spread the ball around the field. And the way that you adapt to that is by allowing certain things and then not allowing other things. So you allow teams like Washington who really just want to, they want to go for it all every single play exaggeration, but play with it. They want to go for it all every single play. If you will, if you don't allow them to do that and you make them dink and dunk their way down the field, they'll get really impatient and they'll make a mistake. And Michael Penix made two mistakes in the national championship game because of that. Mm -hmm. So 
what I think they're bringing to the Big Ten is more of that type of offense. But the Big Ten is actually, at least Michigan and Ohio State, are fairly well prepared for that. So I think that'll be really interesting. What I think could potentially happen here is that every team in the Big Ten is going to need to adjust to this hybrid style of defense that plays against the run just as well as it plays against the pass or vice versa. And that's something that I think you're only really seeing at like Michigan or Iowa right now. Iowa is just good at defense for some reason. But Michigan, (laughs) Michigan really takes that whole bend, don't break and allow certain things, don't allow other things or worse things to heart. And Michigan, Michigan is fine with allowing teams to just waltz their way down the field. But as soon as they get into the red zone, they're taking everything away because the team, the, the offense doesn't have nearly as much field to work with. And I think that's, that's what uh, Washington brings to the big 10 is that type of offense that wants a lot of the field to work with. So it'll be interesting to see is if they, they can adapt their running game to meet the big 10 style of defense. All right. Boom. Boom. (laughs) Our next one. <clears throat> is the Oregon Ducks. The Oregon Ducks we've heard a lot about because they've been uh, a top 10 team, top 15 team for quite a while now. Yes, Here's what we have. Uh, but bringing <clears throat> us into Oregon, <clears throat> at a glance, the coach is Dan Lanning, and this is his, oh, is this second? Oh, shoot. Second or third season. Um. The all-time record for Oregon is actually worse than Washington, 627 to 469 to 34. Uh, conference titles, they either have 13 or 14. There seems to be some confusion on this. I think that's one of those disputed national or uh, disputed conference titles. Their most recent one was in 2020, which is you know interesting in and of itself. They have no national titles. And from what I understand, there's a quote out there that says Oregon is the best team to not have a national title. <laughs> not as in wow. they're it's good that they don't. It's they're the best team that has never won a national title. So yeah. maybe they've got one coming here pretty soon. I uh, their bowl games, they're 17 and 20, so they're on the the losing side there. Their last game was January 1st, oh, 2023. No, 2024. I'm sorry. January 1st, 2024. Uh, where they played Liberty in the Fiesta Bowl, and they won 45-6. to six. Ouch. <laughs> Their next game will be August 31st versus Idaho at Outson Stadium, which we have to get used to saying now. Oregon Stadium is Outson Stadium. It's not Autzen. Ots- well, Outson, Autzen. I guess it depends Outson. on where you're from. So it must have been a German bloke who uh, they named it after. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Lanning's uh, coaching history starts at Arizona State, where he was the shoot. What is RC stand for? <laughs> RC. I, you know, when I put that in there, I thought I I typed RB, but anyway, he was the RC. Maybe you meant RB. No, I think I thought I typed RB, but I think it is RC. I'm just not sure what it stands for now. Well, I can look for it. All right. So in 2013, he was at Arizona State. He went from there to Sam Houston State and then over to Alabama, where he was a graduate assistant. Uh, 20, oh, you know what? So as an RC, he's probably uh, an intern of some sort. If he On was campus graduate, recruiting, recruiting coordinator. Recruiting ah, coordinator. That's recruiting it. Recruiting coordinator. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then he was over at Alabama as a graduate assistant. In 2016 and 17, he was at Memphis. Uh, where Lou Esposito hails from. <clears throat> <laughs> 2018, he was at Georgia as the uh, uh, outside linebackers coach, offensive linebackers coach, outside linebackers coach. Uh... Shoot, I should look these <laughs> things up before I type them in there. 2019 to Out- 21, he was a what? Outside linebacker. Outside linebacker. Okay, I was right the yeah. first time. You were. Uh, 2019 to 21, he was at Georgia as a defensive coordinator, outside linebackers coach. So 2022, he started at Oregon. Uh, So this is, in fact, his third year at Oregon. In 21, Georgia was undefeated and won the 22 college football national championship. So that's when he was the defensive coordinator at Georgia. Georgia defeated Michigan in the Orange Bowl and Alabama in the national championship game. Yeah. So he's got he's got some cred there. He does. He does. 
<laughs> he is really good at riding Kirby Smart's coattails. Sure, sure. <laughs> In 2022, uh, Oregon finished 10 and three, uh, ranked 15th. In 23, they were 12 and two, and they were ranked number eight. In 24, they have several key players returning, but they are breaking in a new quarterback. The quarterback options are Dylan Gabriel and Dante Moore. And I think we said that Dylan Gabriel was probably going to get the starting, uh, starting job. Okay, yeah, I think that's what we said. I've got an interesting tidbit for you, though, if I could divert just for a second. Sure. So Dan Lanning here was hired in 2018 by Georgia as the outside linebackers coach, which you just said. Mm -hmm. Um, He was promoted to defensive coordinator after Georgia's former defensive coordinator left to accept a head coaching position at the University of Colorado. That was Mel Tucker. <laughs> I don't know. I just I, I felt the need to point that out. I <laughs> just tuck coming, tuck going. Man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just funny to me. <laughs> this is funny. Yeah. There yeah. are 20. Wait a minute. Did I put the quote at the end? Oh, I did. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna skip over that and come back to it. Uh, rumors had landing heading to Alabama, but according to Duck's wire, because everybody's got a wire, the I grass really isn't always wire. greener on the other side, but it's damn green in Eugene. As Lanning put it on Thursday morning, announcing he was staying at Oregon and passing on the vacant head coaching job with the Alabama Crimson Tide. So I don't know. I, I tried to find this out. I did, I did research this to find out if he was actually offered the job at Alabama or not. I think he was on the list, but I don't know that he was ever offered the job. Yeah, I think he was on their short list. He was on their short list. All right. I'm pretty sure, yeah. At any rate, he stayed at Oregon, uh, and now we have to deal with him. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are looking at uh, Oregon's 2024 schedule. And again, my question to you, Mac, is what are the key games do you see here, and what impact do you think this has? What do you expect from them in their first year in the Big Ten? So key games are Michigan and Ohio State. <clears throat> um probably more so Ohio state than Michigan. Like I, I want to have a healthy level of skepticism for Michigan in Sharon Moore's first real year as head coach. So I'm just going to kind of assume that Michigan's going to be in not necessarily a rebuilding year, but in a year where it's like, maybe they won't win the big games like they have been. So we'll just play with that for a second. Right now, Ohio state and Oregon are the favorites to win the big 10. It's going to be one of those two. And so to me, that means that the Ohio State game really is the measuring stick um, by which we will determine Oregon's sustained success, potentially in the Big Ten, but certainly in their first year. The way I see it is they had a really good team last year, and Bo Nix is a really good quarterback. But they couldn't beat Washington and they probably should have, you know, I, I think that they honestly probably should have beaten Washington both times. Um, they just, they couldn't get it done possibly because Washington's offense was just that good and took, took, um, what they could against Oregon's defense and Oregon's defense just couldn't keep up. I don't really know. Wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to them last year, but if that's the case, <laughs> then they're going to be having some trouble against teams like Ohio State and Michigan. And is Talia Tugavailoa still at Maryland? Because they might even have some trouble with that offense too. But I don't know. know. Anyway, the point being is that I think Ohio State is the measuring stick. If, If Ohio State plays Will Howard and Will Howard's not a runner, then they'll have an easier time with Ohio State, especially because that's a home game. Michigan being on the road, though, is really interesting because that's going to be a hostile environment. And Michigan's defense is going to be nasty. The question is whether or not Michigan's offense will be scoring at that point. So those are the two key games that I see. In terms of how their first year is going to go, so I've already got Michigan and Ohio State as toss-ups. Everyone else is a win. So I see their their floor being 10-2 and and their ceiling being 13-0. Ooh, 
which means that they would win the Big Ten. Now, do right. I want a former Pac-12 team to win the Big Ten in the first year of them being in the Big Ten? No. But would I prefer that over Ohio State winning the Big Ten? Yeah. Yeah, I think I would. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the... It, it is, it's going to be embarrassing, I think, for the for the old teams of the Big Ten if... Washington, Oregon, UCLA, or USC comes in and dominates. Um, because, like, like we said before, that you know Nebraska, I they they said they were going to come in and dominate, and didn't, and so that's okay. But it but is, if yeah. any of these teams come in, I mean, they and you know they're all just as good or better than Nebraska, so it it could be an interesting year. Or, well, it will well, be that, an interesting year. They'll yeah, I mean they're they're obviously better than Nebraska, but. I I don't know. I, Oregon's one of those teams that really should have been they should have had a better season than they did. And and frankly, I think Ohio State is kind of the same way. They should have had a better season than they did, but some coaching issues, um some bad play calling in in bad spots led them to not. So if Dan Lanning can get out of his own way, and he's a phenomenal coach otherwise, it's just he makes some head scratching decisions at some points. And, and while not as bad as James Franklin, he sometimes doesn't put his team, his offense, especially in the best position to win. So if he can get out of his own way in that regard, then I, I think Oregon probably should be the favorite to win the big 10 this season. Um, that game against Michigan though, and the game against Ohio state, those are really interesting to me though. So I, I would still have those at toss ups, but it looks like Tulua Tagovailoa uh, is not at Maryland this year. He's not. He's I guess he's graduated, but I don't I don't see where he's going. There there's a report here on is he a, an NFL prospect, and it says he's a decent player, but not, might not reach that level. Which I thought I find interesting. I thought he was a graduate at Maryland still. I can't find him on the roster. Weird. All right. Yeah. You're searching T A L. Whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> -A I tried really hard there for a second. Like T A L I A. Sound it out. <laughs> Talia Talia Tagovailoa. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. No, he's All not, right. He's not there. Well. It All definitely right, matters right. in terms of whether or not Oregon's going to win the Big Ten. All right. <laughs> Not necessarily germane to the conversation. No. All right. Our next team, the UCLA Bruins, who ooh, and ooh. I, I've always been jealous of this. They get to play at the Rose Bowl every Saturday. Well, not every Saturday, but, you know, every home game. Yeah. Which, you know, hats off to them, I guess. That's That's got to be a cool place to play football <laughs> I did regularly. Not I did not realize that that was their home stadium until maybe yeah. a year or two ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yep. And so it was funny because I, before I learned that I always thought like, what do they do with the Rose bowl? Like 365 <laughs> or 364 days out of the year. Like what else is do they do with it? Like, yeah, I always wondered about that too. I, I don't remember when I found out it was their, their home stadium. It was a long time ago, but yeah, I used to think that too. What do they do with it? <laughs> It just sits there empty. It just sits there, yeah. So UCLA is coached by Deshaun Foster this year, and it is his first season. UCLA is 637 to 446 to 37 in their all-time record. They have 17 conference titles. The most recent was in 1998. That's a wow. long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. They have one, one national title in 1954. And they are 17 and 20 and one in bowl games. Last year, their last game was December 16th, 2023 against Boise State. They did win that game, but they were unranked at the end of the season. Actually, I don't think they were unranked for most of the season. Their next game is August 31st uh, at versus Hawaii in Honolulu, Hawaii. And that's where that whole travel thing is coming in. They've got to go 3,000 miles <laughs> to the west <laughs> and then 3000 miles to the east <laughs> these guys are going to rack up those uh, freaking flyer points 
Yeah, really. Why are they going to Hawaii? I that's been one of their traditional uh non conference games, I think. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, because to me but, that's like know, if traditional might not be the right word, but they've they've often played Hawaii as a non conference game. Oh, all right. To me that feels like if Michigan went to like FAU or something. Yeah. Yeah. Actually what uh Oh, wait a minute. What? Well, anyway, I wonder what I forgot to look up what conference Hawaii is in. Uh, Deshaun Foster, uh, as a player, he played at UCLA from 1998 to 2001. Uh, then he was at the Carolina Panthers and the San Francisco 49ers in his NFL career. And his coaching career started at Texas Tech as a running backs coach in 2016. So he has not been doing this for very long. Well, he has eight years. That's hmm. I. 2017 to 23 is the running backs coach at UCLA and since Chip Kelly. Yeah. Chip Kelly went to uh, Ohio state. He became the head coach at UCLA, which apparently so Foster played running back at UCLA and spent 10 years as an assistant coach hired in February 24. After Chip Kelly's departure to Ohio state, Foster is a UCLA hall of famer. Uh, He was picked over 11 other candidates to be the head coach. And this is his first time as a head coach. Hmm. This is one of those rare times, I think when, you know, well, Sharon Moore would be another one, but he was kind of groomed for the role. As we said, I don't know that Deshaun Foster was groomed for the role, but he has been hired as the head coach. He is not the interim coach. He is the head coach. This is questionable. (laughs) Why? (laughs) I mean, running backs coach at Texas Tech. Yeah. And then running backs coach at UCLA during a point in time when UCLA was not good. Yeah. I mean, I I get it. Like, I just made a whole point with Ohio State that they need the rest of the, they need an offensive line for the running game to be any good. Right. But. I don't know. I mean, if I'm UCS UCLA's athletic director. I'm kind of looking at him like maybe he'd be not my first choice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I want to say they were scrambling to get a head coach, but they're not the first team to scramble to get a head coach. So yeah, but I, I'm I mean, not exactly sure what's going on at UCLA because they have not been the UCLA of the past. So no, but also like you're, you're telling me that there was literally no one else available. Well, there were 10 other guys available or 11 other guys available. All right, who was coaching Liberty last year? Like he, uh, <laughs> I feel like he left to go somewhere. I, I can't remember exactly, but they should have got him. Yeah. But they should have gotten somebody. They should have gotten a head coach. I you, You've got a former power in UCLA coming to the second most powerful conference in CFB along with you know, the, the national champion runner up and the PAC 12 champion runner up. And you went with the running back coach. <laughs> now he could totally, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm being a hater. Like he could totally turn out to be a phenomenal hire. And I hope he is. I hope that works out for them. That would be great. But this feels really risky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he's got nothing here that says he's even got a high ceiling. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, he's an untested head coach. I okay. Time, the, so the other thing is too, I, Chip Kelly likes to throw the ball, so yeah. that means if you're a running back coach, you're not doing a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> so. Ah, they they hired a running back coach with no head coaching experience who was the running back coach underneath a head coach who likes to do nothing but throw the ball. Right. Uh, I don't know. Foster this, said this is his dream job. He bleeds yeah, these colors. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> ah, this is a bad idea. Yeah. All right, here we go. Same question. Uh, what do you see as UCLA's key games for the season, and what do you expect from them? Well, Dante Moore, I think, was supposed to be their starting quarterback, but he transferred to Oregon. Yeah. And um, 
I, I believe they had some roster turnover aside from that, but just looking at what they got in terms of a coaching staff and how I feel about how risky that hire is. <laughs> yeah, this is, this might not be a good season. Um, yeah. I would put them at a level where, all right, so they, they're, they're going to beat Hawaii. I fully, I fully believe he'll beat Hawaii. Um, <laughs> Dave's here says, did he walk across broken glass from San Diego? Apparently <laughs> from San Diego. What was he doing in San Diego? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about this guy, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Hawaii, they should beat. Indiana, they should beat. Well, LSU. USC is in San Diego. It is? Isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. No, maybe not. Never mind. Go ahead. Keep going. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, UC, uh, LSU, they're, they're going to lose. That's going to be bad. Oregon, they're going to lose. Penn State, they're going to lose. Minnesota, that's a toss-up oh, to me. They're what? in Los Angeles. I'm sorry. Yeah, San Diego is way south. I, I thought USC it was in Los Angeles. Angeles. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um... Minnesota, they're, they're, I think I just said they were going to lose. I No, that, they're not going to lose to Minnesota. Um, oh, that's what Hoke said. That's what Hoke said. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Minnesota is a toss-up to me. Rutgers is a toss-up to me. Nebraska should be a lot better this year, so that's a toss-up to me. They've got Dylan, D- D- uh, something Riola. I can't remember his for Dylan Riola. He was the Georgia commit. Nebraska stole a five-star quarterback recruit from Georgia. So they got something brewing in Lincoln. I tell you what. Uh, Iowa, they're probably... No, they they have something brewing in UCLA. (laughs) 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 And we're going to end the stream right there. (laughs) I got to get a dad joke in somewhere. No, you don't. Uh, Iowa, they're they're gonna they're gonna. Uh, <laughs> Iowa's a toss up to me. Washington is a toss up to me. USC, they're gonna lose. Fresno State, they should beat Fresno State. So what is that? One, two, three wins. Three and nine is their floor, and. What did I say were toss ups? Minnesota, Rutgers, Nebraska, Iowa, and Washington are all toss ups. So three and nine is their floor, four, five, six, seven, and five is their ceiling. Three and nine. Yikes. That's just, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Just based on, I the guy was a running back coach. I'm sorry. Like he doesn't have any head coaching yeah. experience. I don't know. Well, I guess ah. last year they went eight and five. All right. So actually, if they went seven and five, I'd be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Yeah. The year before that, nine and four. Man. Yeah. Man. So. I Yeah, that's that's what I got. I don't have any good news for UCLA fans. So it's probably good that we haven't like gone to UCLA. <laughs> the I don't know. It's, it's good that we haven't gone into that market yet. Yeah. Because. Yeah. Because that's. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be good for them. No. Rod Farva is out there. He says these Michigan shows keep showing up in my algorithm. Good. Yeah, Cause they're good. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> also, thanks for hanging out. We really appreciate that. You're thanks there. for hanging out. Yeah. It's been a little <laughs> quiet out there today. We're, uh, we're happy to see you guys. Uh, good to talk to everybody. Mac, are you ready to go on to our last team? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. We are looking at USC Trojans. Oh, USC, of course, has been uh, and uh, continues to be a very strong team. Nah, not accustomed to seeing them in the Big Ten. So, again, this is one of those. It's that weird situation. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, it, it really is bizarre. I, I'm just I'm trying to wrap my head around this. I'm trying to get used to. Washington, Oregon, UCLA, and USC being in the Big Ten. That's part of the reason why I wanted to do this for this show. Is It's not necessarily just to introduce them to everybody else. It's to introduce them to me. Because, yeah. I mean, I know who they are. It's not like they're unknown. I made the joke at the beginning about, oh, these, these teams that nobody's ever heard of, literally had never seen them before, and now they're in the Big Ten. Hey, I'm just joking around. I just, I'm not 
it's so weird to see these teams in the Big Ten because I am so used to, well, I'm used to the Big Ten being the Big Ten. Even when when Penn State joined the Big Ten, I thought, well, this is weird. <laughs> um, because then it was supposed to be the Big 11, but... yeah. Well, and then Nebraska joins the Big Ten, and that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a reasonable Buckeye, I swear, says Rod Farva. Okay, I believe you. We're happy to have you. Are you the guy that defended us in the comment section of our Ohio State video and said we had a low key? Who was that? I wanted to put that that comment on our uh, on our like frame so that we could frame it and say like, "Hey, thank you. That was very kind of you." Yep. Uh, who was that? Was that, I gotta uh, find that real quick. Trevor Pallack. Uh, so that was, that was a different guy. Oh, okay. Well, either, either way, Rod Farva, I've seen you in the comments a few times now, so appreciate you hanging out. Yeah, man. Thanks. All right. USC Trojans, USC at a glance. This is what we've got. Lincoln Riley, uh, is their head coach. This is his second or third season. He is, eight, or no, I'm not sorry. He is not. Uh, the all-time record for USC is 875 to 368. So they're up there. They're they not are. Michigan up there, <laughs> but they're up there. <laughs> they have 39 conference titles, which is pretty good. Their last one good. was in wow. 2017. They have 11 national titles. Their most recent was in 2004, and they are 36 and 21 in bowl games. This is a team that is an historic power in college football. They are a good mm-hmm. team. Mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm. it's the University of Spoiled Children. We know that. <laughs> Nevertheless, a good football team. <laughs> <laughs> Their last game was December 27th, 2023, which means they were not in the CFP playoffs. Uh, they went up against number 15, Louisville, and they won 42-28 to in the Holiday Bowl. Their next game will be September 1st against <laughs> Brian Kelly's LSU. Man, LSU is going to have a heck of a season next year. (laughs) Jeez. And that'll be in the Vegas kickoff classic. Sweet. Lincoln Riley's credits. He was the wide receivers coach at Texas Tech from 2008 to 2000, or I'm sorry, 2007 to 2009. Uh, He went to East Carolina the as the OC uh, a couple times in room there it looks like he shifted things around a bit he was went from the OC quarterback coach to the AHC I didn't look that one up either um I then he you. went over to Oklahoma and started out as the OC there and then became the head coach from 2017 to 2021 and now he is the USC head coach so 22 23 so yeah this is his third season this uh, is some interesting news on him then is that there are conflicting reports as to why he left Oklahoma. Fox sports reported he was unhappy with Oklahoma going to the sec. This is why this is relevant. He was not happy with the realignment, but OU's athletic director, Joe Castiglione said Riley had been on board with Oklahoma's shift to the sec. And then he left, which must have been a surprise because just three days earlier, Riley was announced as the USC head coach. So I think the yeah. um, I think the AD over there at Oklahoma did not realize that was going to happen, and it happened. Yeah, I remember <laughs> I was in the Walmart parking lot here in Holland <laughs> when I got the notification on my phone saying Lincoln Riley has accepted the job to be the next coach at USC, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> Oklahoma was good ish. I mean, like they didn't have a defense, you know, par that's par for the course for Lincoln Riley teams, but they didn't, you know, but they were good. So why? <laughs> but I don't know that that's really weird. I don't know. As soon as any, any head coach says, Oh, I'm so happy to be at this school. I don't believe you. Yeah. They're probably <laughs> looking for a job. Yeah. They're probably looking for another job. Yeah. <laughs> we have some interesting chats going on over here. We do. Uh, Kevin Chavis, I've not seen you around. Good to have you here, buddy. I am an unbiased, sensible, fair, honest Ohio State fan. Excellent. Good to have you here. You are most welcome. And Rod Farvis says things are that bad in Lexington? Kentucky? I right. could be. Uh, yeah. Oh, because he, oh, yeah. uh, he was saying John Calipari is expected to be the next head coach at Arkansas. Uh, that's college basketball. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. We're a college football channel only. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know That's what you're talking about. Out. Yeah. Um, I am not unbiased Michigan fans who accept my team's shortcoming that I recognize. All right. <laughs> Wait, what? He's not unbiased. Who recognizes I'm... the shortcomings. For who? Michigan? I'm not unbiased Michigan fan who accepts my team's shortcomings. Oh, I get yeah. it. I get it now. My bad. Yeah. All right. Rod has a question. We're going to get to that in a minute. I uh, right. going back to USC. Uh, in 22, they finished 11 and three at number 10. They lost their bowl game to Tulane by one point, one oh. heartbreaking point. Oh. 20, in 23, they were eight and five and finished unranked with a win at the Holiday Bowl. In 24, they have key players returning, including. Miller Moss, who has been a backup the last two years at the quarterback position, who we did actually talk about in the quarterback video. Yes, we did. Yes, I we remember did. that because I have no idea who that person is, but I remember his name. So, yes. Yeah. Tim Prangley at Trojans Wire reports Lanning saying, I mean, it's a new team and it's every position group that has something new about it. And then on top of it, we're installing a brand new defense. So there's major changes at every offensive position. Even though the system's still the same, we have a new position coach in the offensive room. Uh-oh. What that's code for is, please don't expect a lot from us this season. <laughs> We're trying to figure things out. <laughs> We're going to suck, guys. Yeah, so then, here we are. <clears throat> here is the schedule for the 2024 season. Mac. Oh. What do you see as their key games, and what do you expect from USC? I don't know how I feel about this schedule. <laughs> this is like so crappy from a Big Ten point of view, but like they they really lucked out, but ex except for the fact that they've got LSU and Notre Dame. Yeah, I don't know LSU. They're probably going to lose. Utah State, they'll win. At Michigan, they're going to lose. Wisconsin, that's a toss-up. Minnesota, they're going to win. Penn State, that's a toss-up. At Maryland, they're going to win. At Ruck or, uh, Home against Rutgers, they're going to win. At Washington, that's a win. Versus Nebraska, that's a win. At UCLA, that's a win. Notre Dame's a toss-up. Um, So what did I just say? 0-1, 1-1, 1-2, 2-2, 3-2, uh, it's a toss up. So what? Oh my gosh. I just lost count of everything I did because this is, I hate this <laughs> schedule, man. This is so dumb. It's basically, yeah, it's, it's, this is basically just a pack 12 schedule. Kind of. Uh, I mean, I don't well, really know what I mean by that. I'm just focused on the fact that they play Washington and UCLA. That upsets me. Like they, they completely miss Ohio yeah. state. I guess they've got Michigan. Oh, they do. State, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Because I wanted that Ohio State USC game. Why? I don't know. I thought it would have been cool. Yeah. It, I mean, that would have been, that would have been, to me, that would have been like the game where USC plays the type of offense that Ohio State used to play. And USC doesn't have a defense. So Ohio State probably still would have scored a lot. Yeah. Yeah, which like the Rod Farva here says USC versus LSU first to 100 wins. Yeah, I mean, that probably would have been the same thing with Ohio State, USC uh, too, honestly. Well, no, Ohio State's got a lot better of a defense. So I've got what? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six wins. Six and six is their floor. Uh, that was a toss up. That was a toss up. Eight, six and six is their floor. Eight and four is their ceiling. Really? Just eight and four? Well, maybe nine and three. Yeah. Because I don't think they're going to beat LSU. They're not going to beat Michigan. And Wisconsin, nine and three. Yeah, because Wisconsin was another toss up. So nine and three is their All ceiling. Right. I think they lose against Penn State. And I think that that they lose against LSU and they lose against Michigan. Almost well, and that's, sure. that's probably indicative, I guess, of what they've been saying about the way this new setup is, especially in the big 10 that uh, 
in order to get to a 10 win season is, is a lot tougher now than it used to be. Yeah. Because I mean, USC, well, at the very least USC, Washington and Oregon are going to be tough teams in the big 10. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I, it's like duplicating Michigan, Ohio state and Penn state. And then, you know, on occasion, Michigan state and Wisconsin and, and Nebraska. So it's not like it's not like we're bringing in another Rutgers in Maryland. Oh yeah, no. You know, we're bringing in top no. 10 teams here. Yeah. So. I I'm just surprised that they didn't have USC and Ohio State play this season. Well, they've got a lot of weird things going on this season. I mean, yeah, I guess that's but, that's not something I should complain about, but I don't know. Yeah. So uh Dave's here said says that um USC has a new defensive coordinator and he's from the Ravens. They're Raven line, DC Raven line. Oh, DC. Yeah. I think I heard yeah. that. Yeah. So that's okay. So we probably got to watch that. I mean, he's not a defensive yep. coordinator. He's just working on the line. So it's, it's, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how that's going to translate to the whole of the defense. I mean, the defensive line ought to be pretty good then because the Ravens have had some really good defensive coordinators and defensive assistants. Michigan would know. But mm-hmm. um, who? But they they did bring in a new DC. But the thing is, is that like even Lincoln Riley had said in that quote, they've got a lot of turnover. They've also got a lot of turnover on offense too. So mm-hmm. I you know, I don't really know what to expect. But yeah, I mean six and six, nine and three is the ceiling. Six and six being the floor. I think that's that's what I would expect if they were to knock off Penn State. I think that they would have a better chance of knocking off Penn State than they do Michigan just simply because we don't know what to expect from Penn State's offense or James Franklin as a play caller. It could very well be that James Franklin and Penn State go into the Coliseum and totally wet their pants. That would be really good for USC. (laughs) LSU, Brian Kelly does some very head-scratching things during games as well. He's also kind of the king of all hype and no result. I mean... Brian Kelly had some amazing teams at Notre Dame that should have won championships and didn't probably because of Ryan or Brian Kelly. So these games are technically winnable, but it just sounds like they've got way too much going on in terms of roster turnover and, and some coaching turnover on defense that they've got, they've got to get things solidified. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. So that's Uh, yeah. Dave's here. Dave's here says, I bet USC and LSU will be both, <clears throat> excuse me, will be much improved on defense, particularly USC with their Raven line DC. Yeah. Uh, he also says the new DC at USC uh, would have been Michigan's if he'd have waited a few weeks. And if he wanted it, small detail. <laughs> uh, so, Oh, your screen just froze up. Are you still there? Uh oh, I think we lost Mac. Hold on, everybody. Uh, I gotta see if I can get Mac back. Um, oh, oh, there you are. Now you're back. Are you caught? Oh no, I lost him completely. Okay, hang in there, everybody. I'm gonna get Mac back, and we're gonna put him back online. I think he's actually already here. There you are. There we go. I'm back. Wow, that that was fun. <laughs> that was scary. Holy crap! All right, <laughs> what just happened? I don't know. It just well, didn't up. lose anybody. So nice job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't uh, panic and shut everything down. <laughs> panic. <laughs> so, uh, Rod, Rod, uh, Farva here has a few things on the, um, the USC LSU game. He's saying that the, the line is six and a half LSU. Okay. Wow. That's all right. And that the over under here is already at 66 and a half. Yeesh. <laughs> Goodness gracious. So that's going to be a shootout for those, for that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Jeez. Kevin Chase says he thinks USC's floor is six losses. Ceiling is three losses. I agree with that. Yep, that's where you were. Yep. Um, what else we got going on here? There's a third guy. Ooh. I think Penn State probably beats Penn State too. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. He corrected you. <laughs> I think Penn State oh, beats okay. USC too. <laughs> well, I mean. Yeah. This is also true in many ways <laughs> that Penn State often beats Penn State. <laughs> That's true. Most of the time, Penn State beats Penn State. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Penn State schedule 
uh, set up so nice for them. They better make the CFP. I, I think they will, but I don't think that means anything. Yeah. I mean, they'll be top 12. Yeah. They should be anyway. I mean, they've still got a talented defense. Right. Jason Boat is here. Good evening, Jason. Good, Good evening. Good to see you. And then uh, Rod Farvis says that I, I, it is, but they, but uh, PSU has developed well on defense. For some reason, they just can't on offense. Ooh. What do you think there? Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, I guess the, I, I guess I would say there's a development problem because we did say um, on the last live stream that Penn State quarterbacks, you kind of like you always know what you're going to get with them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a, if, if you know, I, you know what you're going to get from, from them, you, they don't really ever grow their ceiling. So they, they don't ever hit their ceiling and then develop past that. They kind of just always play the same and they've had some good quarterbacks. I think Trace McSorley was pretty good. And then, um, Oh, who was the other guy that was just there? Oh, shoot. Well, whatever. I, but Drew Allar is a good quarterback. But it, he's one of those quarterbacks that if he were at a at a at a program that developed good quarterbacks, then yeah, he would probably be a really good quarterback. But he's at Penn State, and so yeah, I mean, he's probably only going to play up to the level that we've already seen him play. And I think that that's all James Franklin. So I think it still comes down mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, I, I think Rod Farr was right then. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I. I I missed um, Rod Farber's question earlier. I wanted to go back to this one. I question for you, Michigan guys: Who is the better head coach, Ryan Day or Lincoln Riley? Takes a lot of guts to ask Michigan fans this question. Appreciate it. Does yeah. However, I have to back off because I really have not watched Lincoln Riley enough to know how good of a head coach he is. So I'm going to leave this one to you. If you had to pick, who do you think is the better head coach, Ryan Day or Lincoln Riley? Uh, Ryan Day. All right. How come? So, um, Sean Clifford, that's who that, Ke thank you, Kevin. You're right. Sean Clifford. Yeah. Um, Ryan day is the better head coach, uh, because Ryan day, despite the two losses to Michigan, three, three losses to Michigan, um, is 52 and two, I think against everybody else. I want to say that that's, that's what it is. I think it's more than that. he's he's in the fifties in terms of wins and single digits in terms of losses mm -hmm. uh, overall period, but also just against everybody not named Michigan. Um, I understand Michigan 50, is had 56 and eight, 56 and eight. Really? Yeah. Yep. Oh, wow. I was way off. But anyway, um, I understand Michigan has had his number the past three seasons. Um, although this last season, they still almost won like, a, you know, Kyle McCord threw that late interception, but they were, they were driving and that got scary there for a second. Um, but he's still the better head coach because his floor is a lot higher than Lincoln Riley's Lincoln Riley has missed out on bowl games. I think, I, I, I think he's missed out on bowl games. His thing at Oklahoma was that he was always in the running for things and could never get over the hump with Ryan day, even losing to Michigan in 2022, they still made it to the CFP and still almost beat the eventual national champion. So yeah, I, Ryan day is the better head coach by possibly even by a lot, but that would change as soon as Ohio state's program falls apart. It's not going to, but that would change as soon as their program falls apart under Ryan day and Lincoln Riley gets a competent defense going. Or uh, Lincoln Riley. Did I say that? Uh, I'm not sure now. <laughs> <laughs> point Dave's is, Ryan Day is a better head coach. <laughs> yeah, Dave's here makes a good point that it has to be Ryan Day because if OSU isn't great, what good is there to beating them? I don't know. I think it's still fun to watch Ohio State lose. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> but respect where respect is due. They're right, a very right. good football team, and Ryan Day is a really good head coach. As we have said many times, so many times gets lost out there somewhere. I feel like we defend Ryan day more than Ohio state fans do. It feels like it sometimes. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 
Kevin Chase says, Chavis, I'm sorry. Kevin Chavis says, it depends. Do we think Ryan, I'm sorry. Do we think Riley does better than Day if he was at OSU? Do we think Day does better than Riley if he was at USC? Ooh, the old switcho changeo. If you give Ryan Day USC and you give Lincoln Riley Ohio State, then what happens? That's intriguing. Yeah, that one. I think that one's tough because uh-huh. honestly, I think that USC is. I mean, USC and OSU are. I mean, they're they've got to be virtually equivalent teams. No, although, well, I it, guess it's not necessarily. You can't go necessarily by the teams. You're going by the coaches. So, all right, I'm going to take that back then. Well, I guess in terms of program prestige, I feel like USC should be up there, but Ohio State, yeah, every single year is in a is in the conversation for a national title, every single year, and that hasn't been the case with USC, especially in the last few years. Um, even actually, even with Lincoln Riley uh, being at USC, every year they're saying like you know they could be if they could field a decent defense they could be in the national title conversation but they they just don't they end up towards the end of the season they end up just falling off um if lincoln riley were at ohio state i feel like the same thing would happen because lincoln riley is the one who needs to bring in defensive coaches um and he hasn't yet Okay. Okay. And and then Ryan Day is the one, you know, Ryan Day would be the one that needs to adjust against whatever Michigan's doing that has his number. It's mainly defense. And in game, he hasn't yet, but if he were at USC, I think it would still be he would he would still have the coaches, he would still have the coaching philosophy. Probably the same thing would happen. The only reason it wouldn't be though. The only reason I think it wouldn't be the same thing is that Ryan Day was basically handed the keys to a Ferrari <laughs> um, by Urban it. Meyer. Don't say it. <laughs> Why? What'd I do? <laughs> don't make a baseball analogy. Just don't do it. <laughs> That's a baseball analogy? No, I'm warning you off of going to the baseball analogy. Oh. <laughs> Ryan Day was born on third base. Anyway, um... <laughs> Right. But he was, he was, or no, he wasn't born on third base. He wasn't born on third base. He was handed the keys to a Ferrari. And for the most part, he's kept that Ferrari running pretty smoothly. Mm-hmm. Um, let's not forget, like he played for a national championship in 2020. Like they've been in the conversation, even though Ohio state fans think he's like the worst thing since John Cooper. So whatever. I think, I think that that's probably the only thing that makes Ryan day worse at usc is that he's not handed the keys to a ferrari mm-hmm. maybe maybe I'm, i still think that the same thing would happen though <laughs> so rod says so is Sherwin more i mean yeah, technically well. yes well not technically yes that's true he was handed a national championship team so now it's up to Sharon more to see what he can do with it can he can he carry through with what he did in those last three games right yeah. I mean, technically speaking, anyone who takes over a program that was successful was born on third base. <laughs> so, well, but okay. But remember that comment is it's not so much about being born on third base. It's he was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. That part is the, the key element. Yeah. Yeah. So, I you're Yeah, I know you're yeah. right, but I don't, yeah. So Jason Bode says Lincoln Riley would be better at Ohio State. But the question is why? What are the what are the parameters there that would actually make him better? Would he bring it? Well, he would have a lot of talent on defense. So maybe yeah. that's the reason. But yeah. he still needs a coach and he still needs a better defensive philosophy. Uh Red Farber says Day's first year OSU is number one in total defense with Jeff Halfley at DC, then a drop off, but now Knowles has the defense in good shape. Yeah, that's absolutely right. true. Yeah. Um, OSU still finished top five in total defense last year, had issues at time with the run. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Lincoln Riley, Lincoln Riley, Kirby Smart also born on third base. <laughs> 
Okay. Was Kirby Dave, Smart born on third base, though? I, I don't know. Uh, Dave Shear says, you can see from the outside, Dave's football theory is changing. Seems like he is leaning toward the run more. Most people stuff the Ferrari into a fence. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to do if you don't know how to drive a Ferrari. That's true. You're not, you're not used to that kind of power. I, but he brought in Chip Kelly as the OC. And Chip Kelly is very pass heavy, which I don't yeah. have a problem with. Like, I'm not going to say, oh, Ryan Day needs to rely on the run more or else he's going to be a terrible coach and Ohio State's not going to do anything this year. Like, no, they could throw the ball all they want and win the natty. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know if I don't know if anything that I've seen out of Ohio State this offseason indicates that Ryan Day is changing his football philosophy. Yeah. I, so Dave here, Dave's here also says half the team is gone. Sharon more like a bunt single. <laughs> yeah. But again, not, not necessarily because what the entire offensive coaching staff, um, were assistants last year. So they've been developed and developed up to the new position, which is, mm-hmm. I think what you want to do. I, I mean, again, all of this is speculation. It remains to be seen what happens this season. If if this season goes well for Michigan, then everything Sharon Moore has done has been justified. If it's not, then Sharon Moore has to shake things up. Yeah. Right? I Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Kevin Chase yeah. says, I would say second base because Moore had to hire a whole new staff plus strength and conditioning coach had to replace a bunch of players. Didn't have to hire a whole new staff, though. He hired a few, but not a whole mm-hmm. new staff. Like I just said, the offensive line was just people who moved up. Now, I guess if you want to say because they moved up, they're an all new staff, that's true, but they were there. So they know the program. They know Sharon Moore. That's yes. what I think. That's, right. I completely agree. I'm waiting until we get to what Rod says here. This next one? Yeah. UCLA was 17th in total rush offense in 23. Kelly runs plenty. Yeah, so everything that I said was said from the perspective of a mostly ignorant Big Ten football fan. Like, (laughs) obviously, I don't care about Chip Kelly um, or didn't, you know, until he got to Ohio State. So I had to finally look this up. And what I found was this. I have to take back half of everything that I've said about Chip Kelly because I was wrong. Chip Kelly has long been a run-heavy offensive mind. UCLA ran the ball 56% of the time in his six years leading UCLA, and it was uh, was an even higher percentage at Oregon. Over his six years as Oregon's uh, coach and offensive coordinator, their rushing frequency was 62%. So my bad, guys. He's run-heavy. He is actually kind of run-heavy. That's uh, so I thought he was really pass heavy. I thought UCLA was really, really pass heavy, but that actually makes the Tony Alford situation kind of interesting. Because why? Well, why did Tony Alford leave Ohio state when? Oh yeah. 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 Chip Kelly would probably have ran the ball there just as much. I mean, he's probably going to run the ball at Ohio state just as much as he ran it at UCLA in Oregon mm-hmm. or gun or gone, whatever. The so I don't know. I don't know what to expect from this now because Ryan day yeah. has been going really pass heavy in my opinion, I think. Well, no, maybe I shouldn't even say that. I just, <laughs> I just feel like he's recruiting pocket passers. I mean, Kyle McCord wasn't really a runner. He felt like a pocket passer. Will Howard, to me, feels like a pocket passer that can scramble. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's interesting. That's really, really interesting. Yeah, there's there's just so much shakeup right now. Uh, (laughs) I, I, but okay. How much does it play into it though? That I mean, so Chip Kelly, as the UCLA head coach, leaves to be the I'm sorry. He's the OC at Ohio State now, right? It's, is he OC or is yeah. he? Yeah, OC. He's the OC. Yeah. Um, UCLA hasn't been doing that well. Mm-hmm. So what what makes people think that he's going to do well at Ohio State? Ohio State has better recruiting tools. Okay. So maybe so they're going to get think. him the better players. I would think. Yeah, I think okay. UCLA. I think he had a lot of trouble recruiting 
while he was at UCLA. So I'll just pull up their 2023 recruiting class real quick and see where they were at. Um, 37th overall. So, yeah, I think, I think that Ohio State gives him much better, uh, much better resources for recruiting, mm-hmm. and that's probably why that's going to be a better fit. I also I heard rumblings that he just really didn't like being a head coach either, with all yeah. of the different things that he had to deal with. So now being an offensive coordinator, he can focus more on on the craft of offensive play calling and building an offense rather than having to be the CEO of a whole team. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what's going on. Kevin Chavez says, well, Michigan hasn't recruited at a top 10 level, but he does take over for a national champion. So that's in reference to Sharon Moore. Yeah. Um, Which is true. Michigan hasn't done a lot of, hasn't recruited very well from the standpoint of four stars, five stars, that kind of thing but they did just win the big 10 three years in a row on a national championship. So it's not necessarily like we've said many times that, uh, uh, Herb, Oh, Herb, the coach of the hockey team. I can't remember his Herb last Brooks. name. Now. Herb Brooks. His Herb philosophy Brooks. was you don't want the best players. You want the right players. And that's where that plays out. <laughs> Rod Parva. Don't get me started on Tony Alford. We know, we know, <laughs> but then, Comment. You follow up with a comment on him. Alfred struggled in recruiting and development, didn't sign a single running back in 23. He had just one running back drafted in his nine years at OSU. Yep. Is that right? Because he's had, oh, I know what it is, because he's had guys drafted who he uh, he developed but wasn't there when they were drafted. Um, uh, I think... No, I think either way he was still Yeah, I think either way he still only had like one running back get drafted. And I believe it was Ezekiel Elliott. Well, all right, let me have to look I that think. up cuz I thought I Well, all right. I cuz I could have sworn I saw that he was every everybody he's had as starters. Well, maybe okay. His starters have been drafted. But I think somebody said that just because they were his starters, he wasn't there when they were drafted, so he moved on to the next team. Oh, okay. Um, something along those lines. Hmm. I, Dave's here says, anyone who is observant will realize that the last several national championships were, first, uh, were run first defensive teams. Success changes things. Run first defensive teams. Yes. Teams that run first, but are also have strong defense. And yeah, that's true because once that's, that's, I believe standard football practice. First, you want to get your def- defense strong because if your defense is strong and is holding back the other team's offense, that gives your offense time to relax and uh, get into a rhythm. If the offense is constantly playing at a deficit, you know, from behind, then they don't play as well. They don't, uh, settle into their positions and develop a rhythm because they feel like, Oh, we have to hurry up and score to get back ahead. So that's why you want to be uh, a strong defense. Defense wins championships. You want to be run first because if you can get that run, uh, run game established, then you can throw the ball whenever you want. If you're having to throw the ball under stress conditions uh, from being behind, you're probably not going to throw well. And I think that's just nature. What? <laughs> I was just going to say, that sounds like somebody who grew up watching football in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm over here like, I mean, just do whatever you can to mix up the play calling. Spread the ball around. Throw it as much as you want. If you can run the ball, run it as much as you want. You know, I, but I think there, there's a mentality there, though, that if you're if you're the quarterback and you have to throw from a deficit, if your team is behind and you have to throw, you're not going to be as accurate because you're going to try too hard. Unless you can settle down. I mean, well, and that would that's what separates the good players from the great players. A great player, even in that stressful situation, will be able to settle down and make the throw. Yeah. But on average, quarterbacks do much better when they know that they're not playing from from behind. Yeah, well, sure. But 
uh, teams these days are building offenses in such a way where they can throw the ball just as much as they can, or they can throw the ball as reliably as they could run it. So stud quarterbacks yeah. that are, you know, dual, uh, dual threat quarterbacks that can run and, you know, throw the ball and stuff like that. And then, you know, having running backs and, and all that and spreading the ball around, that's, that's what offensive philosophies have morphed into. So it's not really, okay. you don't really have to rely as much on running the ball on first and second down and then throwing it on third down because, you know, you want to get the first down. They're more concerned about what are you doing to spread the ball around and keeping the defense on their toes. Right. And then and I have balance, to keeping the defense off balance. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then I, real quick, I just want to point out, um, yeah, Rod Farber, it wasn't Zeke, Zeke Elliott. I was thinking of JK Dobbins. You're right. And then Trey Sermon got drafted, but he was at OU. All right. So yeah, my bad again, <laughs> Michigan fan. So <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Chavez says, expect a balanced offense, a fusion of Kelly's run scheme and days passing philosophy makes it, a, makes it much tougher to defend. All right. Yeah. 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 You want to copy winners? You do. Uh, I've often heard Chip doesn't like recruiting. Oh, all right. Oh, so that's why he... But isn't he still going to have to recruit as an OC? Eh, not necessarily. Maybe they'll have other coaches recruit for him. All right. <laughs> Okay, going back to our previous discussion, Kelly does better at OSU because of the abundance of talent, and Kelly just focusing on offensive coordinating takes off head coaching pressures, and all of this will bring Kelly's mojo back. Yeah, I completely okay. agree. Yeah. Because Chip Kelly is a very smart football mind. I think he just needed to get into a position where he didn't have to do as much as what he was doing. So maybe he's not a head coach, but he is a really good coordinator. Hmm. Rod Farva says no. Oh, that's the Zeke Elliott, J.K. Dobbins thing. Yeah. Wasn't Ezekiel. Brian Hartline. Zeke? Yeah, that's the guy. Rod Farva. Yeah, you're right. Brian Hartline is the guy who would do the most of the recruiting. He's a really good recruiter, too. All right. Okay. Uh, Trey Sermon was drafted but spent three years at OU. Okay, so they – yeah, so his th – this was somebody that Alfred trained, but then they went – they transferred to OU. I think is what's happening there. Uh, no, I first, think he was at OU first and then transferred to Ohio State. Oh, I'm sorry. OU first. Yeah. Okay. He yeah. says that right there. OU first. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sometimes I read these too fast. It is a quarter after 10. <laughs> well, and there's a bunch of them coming through all of a sudden. This is crazy. I know. <laughs> uh, I'll save you time. They practice on Sunday. <laughs> Sometimes I don't get to these fast enough. What was that about? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, what else we got here? Uh, Brian Hartline will recruit. Kelly won't really need to recruit since Hartline is still there and we got a new running back coach. Yeah, I think the, the running back coach um, that we just talked about too. What was his name? Lachlan? Carlos Lachlan? Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's the new running backs coach, yeah. Yeah, I believe he's a pretty good recruiter, if I remember correctly. I think he's he's mm -hmm. getting dinged for something, though. There was an accusation that he was tampering or something like which, again, who knows what that even means. Right. So it's probably yeah. total crap. But I don't know. There, that was out there. Yeah. Yeah. The thing I liked about 2020 is no home field advantage. That's a big part of the sport, but no advantage is football at its purest. OK, yeah, 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 yeah. If neither team has a home field advantage, kind of like what a bowl game is supposed to be. Yeah, but unless you're at the Rose Bowl with UCLA, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, unless you and UCLA, that would suck for UCLA, wouldn't it? Like, oh, we get to go to the Rose Bowl. Well, <laughs> same as always. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there you go. There's Rod Farva. Who doesn't tamper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. Who doesn't watch game film from other teams? That... Yeah. <clears throat> with signals and sign stealing. Anyway. <laughs> Two things that we can all agree on. Michigan didn't cheat and Ohio State did tamper, but that's OK because who doesn't? And also maybe Ohio State didn't actually tamper. We don't really know and probably never will. And probably also, who cares? Will. Everybody tampers. Yeah. Well, and, and everything has changed now. So all of all of that stuff is different now. Now that yeah. we've got uh, realignment, all of these super conferences now, or at least two super conferences, I, the NIL is going crazy. 
The CFP is going crazy. Is it going to be 12 teams? Is it going to be 14 teams? Or are they going to go crazy and get all the way up to 32? Uh, it's it's going to be fascinating. Will yeah. Michigan maintain a run-heavy offense going forward, or will they eventually open things up? Okay, go ahead. I Well, I've heard rumblings that they might be opening some things up. Um, from what I've heard, Sharon Moore and Kirk Campbell – who was the quarterback's coach and is now the OC, um, wanted to pass a lot more than Harbaugh did. Harbaugh was the main reason why Michigan ran as much as they did. Also, Blake Corum was the reason why they ran as much as they did. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've heard that Sharon Moore, that J.J. McCarthy, I think, even said that under Kurt Campbell as the OC, that alone should mean that they're going to open things up a little bit more. And then Sharon Moore, I think, will also be... Uh, better about that too all right yeah yeah what were you gonna say i well just what we said you know during the season you don't you don't have to throw the ball if you can win on the ground yeah right and and i know one of the well we talked about it but one of the criticisms of michigan in the past has always been they they die by the run it's a die by the run team and uh so that's where this question comes from are they just going to keep running or are they going to finally start opening things up but over the last couple of years, it looked like they were going to open things up, but then they kept winning with the run game. So why risk throwing the ball, risking a turnover if you can win on the ground? Yeah. Uh, okay, last one here. In my opinion, it would boost your recruiting from a skill position standpoint if you open things up more. Well, sure, yeah. I agree. Then you'd pull in a lot yeah. more variety of players, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I I mean, I would agree with that. I also don't really, I, I expect recruiting to get better under Sharon Moore period, because it sounds like he's really going all in on NIL stuff and, um, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Michigan, I, I, they're never going to deviate from the, you got to come here and earn it kind of NIL, which I think is the right move. The thing is though, is that I don't really, if Michigan starts pulling in top 10 recruiting classes, great. If they can keep pulling in somewhere around top 15, top 20 classes, I'm really not concerned with how the team's going to do under Sharon Moore because they've been shown to develop. Mm -hmm. So, well, I guess I wouldn't be concerned because of recruiting. I would be concerned because of the product on the field. But if they just if they don't fall off in recruiting, then I don't care. I, I don't really care how they recruit as long as they say top 20. I'm not worried about getting top five, top 10 classes maybe top 10, but not top five because they can develop. Right. Yeah. All right. I think we're going right. to call it there. Uh, it's getting late. Thank you everybody for uh, joining us in the chat. Always appreciate having you guys there. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, let us know uh, in the comments. You can comment on this video uh, tomorrow, whatever, what, what you guys would like to talk about in the future upcoming shows. We will be back next Sunday for our regular time show. And uh, at 8 p.m. on Sunday evening, that's when we start. If you didn't get a chance to watch the uh, Welcome to the Big Ten video, um, it's it's a good one to watch. It's fun. It's not our regular stuff. It's more of a trash talk kind of video. Uh, and it, it went really well. We had a lot of fun making it, and I hope you guys enjoy watching it. Uh, it is out there on the regular channel. Um, hey, Buckeyes Battlecry just showed up. <laughs> hey. hey, Buckeyes Battlecry. Um, like I said, we are on the road to a thousand subscribers. So like, share, subscribe, comment, share with your friends. And I, uh, we've got more videos coming about all of the big 10, including the new teams coming in and, and whether or not there'll be even more new teams coming in. We Matt, got, we got a new right. sub Rod Farva says a uh, great show or good show. Great. Get, not great yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> says, good oh show God. guys i enjoyed it i'll be subscribing hey thanks a lot man really appreciate that it was great yeah. having you in the chat actually please thanks, come bro. back because we want to know more about ohio state and having you and buckeyes battle cry also buckeyes battle cry dude you got to come here earlier we had so many questions we needed you man <laughs> <We> needed it. <laughs> but yeah also, and, and that's true that's that is one of the reasons we do this is because we want to hear from fans from other fan bases because you know as much as we like to talk trash we also want to be able to talk responsibly um, right. <laughs> trash talk responsibly yeah and uh but you know, we love to have you guys here so we can talk about it and and especially you know we want to be reasonable we're not trying to uh 
uh, drag anybody down or anything either. So, you know, if we can all talk and have fun and, and enjoy football, it just makes it that much better. For sure. For sure. Yeah, Rod Farber, for sure. Oh, yeah. oh Rod Farber says for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. All right. Mac, anything you want to add? No, I think that's going to do it. I'm tired. All right. <laughs> Well, we will see you guys next Sunday night. Um, keep an eye out for the clips from this video. Uh, you can put more comments there if you think of anything else you want to say. And I think that's going to do it for us. Mac, take us out. This is the Big Ten Team Rivalry Show. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.